I'd worked as a police dispatcher for nine years of my life. It's a career that takes a mental fortitude that I don't think many possess. I used to hate saying stuff like that. I always thought it sounded so pretentious. But the truth is, it takes a special type of person to be willing to voluntarily listen to some of the things we have to hear every single day. Don't get me wrong, the job wasn't always grim, and it even had its decent moments. I've got enough decently funny drunk 911 call stories to last me several lifetimes, though the reality of the job was usually far darker. I understood that though, and felt I was more than equipped to deal with anything the job could throw at me. I was right, for a while. For years I had answered every call, always able to keep a steady head despite being faced with some horrific situations. My confidence in my ability to handle the job, unwavering, until the final call I ever took as a police dispatcher. I glanced at the time display at the corner of my computer screen, 11.43. I yawned, leaning backward in my chair with my arms extended as I stretched my back. I'd been at the desk since 3 in the afternoon, answering calls and dispatching officers as they were needed, which wasn't very often in this town. I lived in a little port town in Washington, about an hour or so out of Seattle, and though we weren't without our fair share of crime, our phones never rang off the hook, which meant a lot of free time for me. I was always okay with that, as soul-wrenching as many of the calls could be. Moments of respite were always more than welcome. A notification on my screen caught my attention, and in an instant I had returned to my seat, headset on. 911, what is your emergency? I spoke into my headset as automatically as any line repeated hundreds of thousands of times can be spoken. For a moment, the line was only dead silence before I heard a reply. I need a policeman. I think somebody is in my house. A child whispered from the other line. I felt the smallest of knots beginning to form in my stomach. I shifted in my seat. Do you know your address? I asked, adopting a firm but lighter tone in response to the caller's age. I heard shuffling and heavy breathing from the other end, followed by a faint, wait. The caller returned and whispered the address. She was a little girl by the sounds of her voice, and she sounded scared. Good job. What about your phone number? The process repeated and I quickly relayed the information to dispatched officers. Her address was on the edge of town, a little out of the way, and I understood that it may be a while before help arrived. I stifled a sigh, not wanting to vocalize my worry as I received an estimated arrival time. Is there an adult with you in the house? I continued. No. The little girl replied breathlessly, and I could hear the anxiety rise in her voice as she spoke. My mom works late, and my sister at... There was a pause, followed by an audible sniffing. She's camping with her friends and... Somewhere on the end of the line there was a crash, then a scream. My heart dropped. Are you still there? Are you alright? There was a repetitive thumping sound, followed by the slam of the door. I'm here! The little girl spoke breathlessly into the phone. Are you alright? I repeated the question. Yes. Was all that she replied barely above a whisper. Her tone worried me. She sounded more than afraid. Sad? No. Disturbed was the proper word for it. Then she began to cry. Not as quiet as you would expect given her situation, but a deep, helpless sob that made my heart sink. When she spoke, it stopped altogether. Please, please, please help me. Her sobs turned into a hysterical cry and I could hear loud repetitive thumps from her end. Footsteps and they were clearly not hers. They were heavy, far too heavy for a little girl. Without warning, a shill cry like the sound of microphone feedback rang through my headset. The sudden assault on my ears caused me to jump, and my heart set off racing like a jackrabbit. I fought the instinct to throw the headset off and instead clenched my eyes shut, and the noise faded as suddenly as it had come. I saw it, she sputtered through sobs. Oh, please, please, I don't know what it is. The frantic and frenzied nature of her begging increased, and the strangeness beginning to settle in the air that I couldn't quite place. A quick glance around the room confirmed that most of the desks around me were empty, and I was on the call alone. The thought made me feel very isolated, and a growing uneasiness continued to take hold of me that I couldn't place. Something about the call just felt wrong. Police are on the way, I began. 
I tried to infuse the statement with my usual level of assertiveness and confidence, but I was worried that the uneasiness may be audible in my voice. Can you tell me your name? I asked. Amber. All right, Amber. Are you or can you get somewhere safe? A room with a door you can lock. In my room, she said through her sniffles, and it was obvious that she had been crying profusely. I, I locked the door. Good. I'm going to stay with you on the line. Is there anywhere for you to hide? The sound of footsteps grew in the background as her voice lowered to a whisper. I think under the bed, she whimpered. Okay, is there? I paused, thinking over my words before continuing. Anything you can use to protect yourself. There was silence on her end for a moment, followed by a hushed, yes, as she dropped the phone. I assumed to get a weapon. The clamor from within the house had grown closer to the phone, and the piercing ringing sound had returned. I was almost certain there had to be something wrong with my headset or with Amber's phone, and the sound grew to an almost unbearable extent, matched only by the deafening thuds from somewhere on the phone. It sounded too close. I could feel the hairs begin to rise on the back of my neck, and the ominous sense of panic began to give way to an unexplained fear. The urge to look over my shoulder grew harder to fight, as the persistent thudding sound grew louder, nearer. It all sounded too clear, I guess. There was no static, none of the white noise typical of a phone call, nothing. Just the sound of the footsteps approaching closer. Closer, I gave into my instinct, whipping around in my seat, nearly losing my headset. No one. I had no time to settle my nerves as Amber returned to the line. Are you there? She whispered, yanking me from my fog and back into the moment. Y yes, I replied. I struggled to shake off my fears. Something was very wrong with this situation. Despite my worries, I shifted my attention back to Amber. I... there isn't any weapon, the girl muttered. But I have something. Oh, okay. What do you have? I asked, realizing my prompt was necessary. Uh, a rabbit? A pink rabbit, she said. And even on the phone, I could hear a little embarrassment. My dad gave her to me when I was little, she sniffed. He, he said she would keep me safe. I didn't know what to say for a moment, but didn't want to miss a beat. He was right, I said as encouragingly as I could. Everyone knows pink bunnies are great protection. Can you go back under? I was interrupted. Amber, I miss you. I could hear a man call from within the house. So, the intruder knew her. I furrowed my brow. Amber, do you recognize that voice? I asked, hoping she could identify the intruder. There was silence for a moment before her response. It, it sounds like my dad. Why does it sound like my dad? I blinked. What do you mean? That's my daddy's voice. Why does it have my daddy's voice? I didn't know how to respond to that. Hell, I didn't know what to think about. Had his voice? Before I could ask what she meant... We were interrupted by a sound. The thing we heard has taken me years to try to understand. I've come to believe it was that uh, thing's laugh. At the time, though, we couldn't know. It was the sound of metal crunching in a car accident as it met flesh. A wet, grinding shriek that shook me to my core. I wanted to vomit, and my vision began to blur. I can only imagine what it was like for Amber, hearing all that in person. Uh, Amber, I panted, my senses returning to me all at once. She barely had time to respond before we heard it. A voice or voices calling for her from somewhere nearby. They spoke as one all with the same odd inhuman nature dripping with malintent. Amber. My blood froze. Amber began to cry, her cries eventually becoming pleased as she begged for help. Her life, her mother, and my intervention. Five... Five more minutes. Just five more minutes, I muttered, mentally cursing the timer which displayed the estimated arrival time of the dispatched officers. I prayed it would be soon enough. It's... it's outside the room, she whispered, her voice one of utter panic before breaking into a quiet sob. I silently swore under my breath. Amber, I need you to hide right now if possible. The police are three minutes away. Stay as quiet as possible. There was no response, but I assumed from the shuffling sounds I could hear that she had gone back under the bed. For a few moments there was silence. Then Amber spoke and my heart dropped. 
I'm going to die. You're not going to die, Amber. I began, worry now audible in my voice. I promise. I... It's reaching under the door. I... Oh my god. She muttered. There was a crash louder than before, and Amber began to shriek. The noises continued and it began to dawn on me what I was hearing. It was breaking down the bedroom door. Amber's screams had devolved into horrified babbling and pleas for her life to whatever was on the other side of that door. Her screams were soon drawn out by the same noise as before. That sick fucking laughter. Are you there? Amber shrieked, loud enough to make my ears ring. Please, what are you? What are you? It mocked in a voice that was some sick parody of Amber's. Panic gripped me as I glanced back at the corner of the monitor displaying the dispatch unit's arrival time. 1.36. Please, God, let it be soon enough. Amber, are you there? I called. Amber! As suddenly as it had started, everything went silent. Somewhere in the distance I heard sirens. I hear them, Amber. Officers are a minute away. Silence. My heart began to sink. Amber, are you there? I could hear something shifting, breathing. I... I think it's gone, Amber said. A surge of relief rolled through me, and I let out a sigh and leaned back in the chair. 27, the dispatch time read, and the sirens in the background grew louder. You did very well, Amber. Police are almost there. You did really well. I couldn't think of what else to say. I had never had a call like this, and something about it all felt so strange. Something Amber had said began to ring in my mind. What are you? Amber, I began. What did you see? I was met with silence. Amber? Amber began to laugh. Amber, I said, my voice bleeding. A wave of realization crashing down on me. The laughter grew more raucous and less human with every second. Somewhere in the background there was a knocking sound. They'd finally arrived too late. I asked the only thing I could think of at the moment. Why? The laughter stopped abruptly, and the thing on the phone spoke. It was fun. There was a click, and the line went dead. The house was empty when officers arrived. No signs of forced entry anywhere except the door to Amber's bedroom, the bottom of which had been torn away by something leaving a wide space to crawl beneath. And Amber, or what was left of her, decorated the room. Whatever had been there left nothing behind to identify it, only carnage. The case was never officially closed, and everyone had their theories as to what had happened that day, ranging from serial killers to a bear attack and everything in between. The call was never made public, not my decision, but not one I necessarily complained about either. I never want to hear that recording again. I put in my two weeks notice that same night, though I never returned to work after that day. I'd been content to try and forget about that call. As callous as it may sound, I was content trying to forget about Amber to forget whatever I had spoken to on that phone, but I don't think it's done with me. Last night, I dreamed, or had thought I was dreaming the sounds of footsteps running throughout my house, as something screeched and laughed and mocked me just outside my bedroom door. I stayed in my bed long into the morning, despite the sounds having stopped, paralyzed by a mixture of fear and confusion until eventually I convinced myself to leave the bed. I crossed the room, Cursing every creak the floor made under my weight, I lowered myself to the ground, holding my breath as I peered under my bedroom door. There was something there, but it wasn't moving. I mustered up the little bravery I had left, rose to my feet, my eyes shut tight and a prayer on my lips. I pulled open my bedroom door slightly and stuck my head out, just enough to see what lay outside. I stifled a gasp and tears flooded my eyes as I bent over to pick up the object. Placed right outside my door was a little pink bunny covered in dark stains. From somewhere within the darkness, just beyond the bedroom door, Amber's laughter echoed. I'm a 911 call taker, and in my profession, I can definitely say that we hear all sorts of crazy things. And I know what you're thinking. Have you gotten the my cat is stuck in a tree call? Yes. Yes, I have. Now, I want to clarify some things before I continue. I will be changing the names of the people involved to protect their identity, the location of where the events took place, and I will not mention the agency I work for. 
In my agency, being a 911 call taker and a dispatcher are two completely different positions. My job is to take the calls as they come in, jot down the necessary information, and then send it over to the police and fire dispatchers so they can send the information to the units out in the field. We work 12-hour shifts, and we get anywhere from 200 to 300 plus calls on a single shift. When I started, I was told that there are three calls you never forget. Your first call, your last call, and the call that will haunt you forever. The day started just like any other. I was working the night shift so I would be at work from 6 in the evening to 6 the following morning. I had my dinner, coffee, and Mountain Dew ready to go. I got situated at my station, logged into the system, and began to take calls. Just a regular night. I had a motor vehicle crash where one driver was trapped inside his vehicle. I had a domestic situation where a kid called in saying that his dad was beating up his mom. And a parking complaint. Nothing major. My buddy Frank was in the station next to me and said, Quiet night, isn't it, Kevin? I turned to him and said, There you go, Frank. Opening that big mouth of yours, you said the Q word, and now the night is going to go to shit. <sighs> For those of you who don't know, the word quiet or any other synonym is frowned upon being said while on shift. He chuckled and went back to his phone. Surprisingly, the night did stay pretty quiet. Around midnight, is when calls start to die down, so I went up and heated my dinner. When I came back, I saw that there was a 911 call waiting to be answered. I asked if anybody was going to take the call, but no one else had it popping up on their screen. I just brushed it off and took the call. 911, where's your emergency? I asked into the phone line. I got nothing but silence. I spoke again. 911, where's your emergency? Still, silence. I took the phone number and ran it through our system to pinpoint the possible location of the call. Because the call came in as a cell phone, I located the cell phone tower it came off of and was able to find where the call was coming from after that. I managed to find that the call was coming from my neighborhood. Nothing struck me as alarming at that point because I get calls like this all the time. 911, where's your emergency? I asked a little louder. Then the phone went dead. Per our general orders, we have to call back. So that is what I did. I called back. But I was met with a voicemail saying the person could not be reached at this time. Again, I wasn't shocked. I get calls where there's an open line and nothing happens more often than not. I hung up, filed the call away. And when I clicked the button to be ready for the next call, the phone immediately rang. 911. Where's your emergency? Again, silence. I looked at the number and it was the same number that had just called me. Listen, if this is a bunch of kids prank calling, know that you are dialing 911 and I will send the police out if this continues to be an issue. Do you understand? I waited for a response, but none came. Hello? Is anyone there? This is a sir. And then a blood curdling scream came across the line. I jumped out of my seat and my headset flew off. I quickly gathered my composure and got back on the line. Hello? Hello, are you there? I tried to get an answer, but all that was there was screaming. It sounded like a woman and something was being torn. I could actually hear tearing in the background. It was hard to make out due to the woman screaming, but I could still hear it. Ma'am, can you hear me? Where are you at? The phone went dead again. I quickly sent a call through to the dispatchers with the information I had. Location, 46728 Benedict Lane. Incident, assault with injuries. Comments, call taker can hear a female screaming and something being torn. Cannot get any further information from the caller. Caller has hung up. Will attempt to make contact again. I sent the call to the dispatcher and immediately the call was sent out due to the severity of my comments. I called the number again but was met with the same voicemail. I tried again, two more times, but I got the same result. I updated the call saying that I couldn't make further contact. 
I watched on my mapping screen as the units were on the way to the house. I looked down and saw a call pending in my queue. I answered the phone, but before I could say anything I was met with the same female screaming again. I shouted to try and get her attention. Hello? Ma'am, can you hear me? Help me! Help me! Somebody help me! I heard her scream into the phone. Ma'am, I have help on the way. Tell me what's going on. He's here. He's here. He's here. He's here. Ma'am, who is there? I'm going to die. I'm going to die. I'm going to die. I'm going to die. Ma'am, you're not going to die. I'm going to be on the phone with you until help arrives. They're almost there. I continued to try and get more information about her, but I wasn't getting anywhere. Then, in the background, I heard a male's voice. Abigail. Oh, Abigail. Why are you hiding from me? We've played lots of games tonight, but hide-and-seek is not one I wanted to play. Ma'am, your name is Abigail? Yes. Okay, Abigail, listen to me. Help is almost there. Tell me, who is this man? I... I don't know. He just appeared in my house and then... Then he... She couldn't finish her sentence before she began to break down crying. The only thing that snapped her out of it was the man. In the background, I could hear a door creak followed by light footsteps and then he spoke. Abigail, if you promise to come out right now, I promise that the last game we play will be fun. It's called Tag. You remember how to play, right? Abigail didn't give a response. Abigail, I know you're in the fucking closet. You don't want to play? Fine, I'll just come in there and join you. I could hear the footsteps get louder and louder as he approached the closet door. It sounded like he was at the door when I heard through the phone, This is the police. The house is surrounded. You have lost. Come out with your hands up and we'll do this the easy way. I guess it really is time to play hide and seek. I heard him say as he ran out the room. Abigail, I'm still here. The police are downstairs. You're safe now. No. I'm not. I'll never be safe. And with that, she hung up the phone. One of the most frustrating things about being a call taker is that you never really get to find out what happens to the calls you send through. I mean, sometimes you'll be able to guess, but 99% of the time, you'll be left in the dark. What I do know about this call is that the guy was never found. The police never saw anyone come out of the house at all, and when they searched the entire residence, they didn't find anyone either. They questioned Abigail about who the man was, but all she could say was, I'm not safe. I will never be safe. No evidence of forced entry or DNA that didn't belong to Abigail was ever found. To this day, no one knows who the man was. Months passed and no further information was ever found until, finally, the case went cold. That call has haunted me since that night. Why am I telling you all about this? It's to warn you and my fellow call takers that there is a dangerous person on the loose. How do I know this? Because he called me. Earlier during my shift, I got a call and when I answered the phone, the voice I heard on the other side sent a chill down my spine. Hello, Kevin. Are we still playing hide-and-seek? Because if we are, it's your turn to hide. This is an incident I remember from the days when I was a cop in the local district. I have told and recalled this many times to my friends and family, for they find it amusing that this even occurred. They were disappointed that I left my cause to this fable of a story. My own family refused to believe me, but it became the occasional spooky story to my friends and family at reunions or camping days. But that's what they say, because they don't really know the shock of what happened to me that night. 
They don't know the reason why that incident will remain engraved in my brain for the rest of my life. There is one thing that I didn't tell them, and I shouldn't if I wanted to remain sane and have a decent life. I needed to forget about that detail, so I started to recall my story to my family while leaving the detail out, hoping my brain would overwrite the details if I recalled it over and over again. But it didn't. This happened in the summer of 2009. I was an officer for two years then, and I was doing pretty good at my job. Life was going great, and my girlfriend had proposed to me on the same day that I was going to. It was phenomenal, to say the least. But then, all that unfolded on that night would haunt me forever. It was May 2009, and me and my new partner, who I will address as Bob, were patrolling the Redwood Street when we heard from dispatch that there was a domestic violence distress from the nearby area that we were in. It was a chance to show the rookie how the pros did it, so I took it up and decided to check it out. As we drove to the house, I could see the houses on the street were quiet, almost abandoned. It looked like nobody lived in this area, but I didn't pay much attention to it. I parked the car in the front of the destination, the house where we had gotten the call from. It looked to be a very simple house with two floors. I opened the door and walked out of the car as Bob followed behind me. I walked up the steps to the porch and instantly saw that the door was a bit open. I took my gun out and signaled Bob to arm himself. I decided that it would have been a bad idea to enter from the front, so I went out the back to see the back door was open too. I and Rookie followed inside quietly. And all of a sudden, Bob yelled to check if there was someone inside. The Rookie move, I know. I smacked him in the head when he did that, but it seemed like we were all alone in the house. The hall was simple. A carpet laid in the center and a few sofas surrounding it. There wasn't much detail to the entire hall other than it was totally generic. I decided to go up the stairs and Bob followed, armed. As I reached the end, I saw three rooms in the little hallway, all open. We went inside. The room was fairly lit, notes scribbled all over the wall, with ideas for stories and a manuscript on the table. I assumed that this house, or rather this room, was home to a budding writer, and it seemed like it. Bob looked around the room as I picked up the manuscript and started to read it. It was about a lady from the Victorian times who was killed brutally. I mean, that's what the manuscript said. While I read the short manuscript, Bob had wandered off to the second room, the one adjacent to the one I was in. He opened it up and then called me. I kept the manuscript down and went to him. My eyes fell on the room as I was weirded out. The room looked to be from the Victorian era. Maybe the writer was creating a role play for that story. I didn't know. I went inside anyway and it was convincing. The props, if they were, but it almost looked like the furniture was really from the Victorian times. Preserved, maybe. Nonetheless, I went out of the room to check the last room that was closed. I opened it up as Bob took his gun out, preparing for the worst. We couldn't take any risk, after all. We were in an unknown house. The door opened, and we could only see darkness. The room was broken. The darkness engulfed it. There were no lights in the bulb sockets. It seemed like there was no power either in the room. It was just utterly broken. Maybe it was being remade. Bob and I checked out the room and found nothing odd. Just a couple of paint buckets and brushes. Nothing out of the ordinary. We closed the door behind us as we went out of the room. I went into the first room only to see that something had changed. There was a Polaroid camera on the bed. Was this camera here before, Bob? I said, as I looked back at Bob, as I might have missed a detail or two in the room. But he shook his head in a not knowing manner. I looked at the Polaroid and, as I picked it up, it started to work. The noise of a picture printing out. As it soon did, the picture fell on the bed, as I didn't grab it in time. Bob picked it up, and as he looked at it, the horror on his face was visible. He was terrified. I asked him why he seemed to be so scared. He gave the picture to me, and as I looked upon it, I too froze in fear. It was a picture of us getting out from the cruiser. 
taken from the window of this room. I was terrified. How could this happen? There was no one in the house to take this picture of us arriving. Nonetheless, in the time I thought about it, the camera printed another picture. This time, it was of me and Bob in the Victorian-styled room, but it was angled from the wall. You could see the spiral stairs behind in the hallway, but that's not what froze me in fear. When I looked at the corner of the picture, I could see a shadow crouched down in the corner of the small hallway behind the door, peeking at us. It was getting harder to breathe, and I showed Bob the picture. He was in another expression. Terrified was an understatement. The camera printed out another picture in the meantime. This time, it was of us being in the dark room. I could see us both exploring the room in the dark as there was a figure in the corner. It was a woman, dressed in Victorian-era clothes. I froze. As I looked at her expression, the inhumane grin spread right through her cheeks. It was animalistic, but how didn't we notice it? The camera printed another picture. This time it was the third room's door opening and the hag of a lady walking out. As the camera finished printing this, we heard the door open and made the run. We didn't look back. We just ran with all the power we had. I opened the car's door and sat in as Bob closed his door. I started the car and threw the camera in the back as he sped out of the block. Apparently it was around 11 when we had reached the quarters and Bob was trying to gain his composure back. What we saw in that house was not of this world. That lady and the inhumane grin on her face gave me chills as I thought about it. But we had left the pictures behind so we had no proof about that. Only the camera that I kept on my desk. Bob left the quarters as he got his stuff to go back to his house. He was scared, and I was too. But as I got ready to leave, the camera curled a bit, as it printed the last picture it would ever print. And that's the thing I don't tell anyone. That detail that I kept hidden from everyone about this incident is the last picture it printed showed me and Bob in the car as we sped away from the house, and the same lady in the back seat grinning inhumanely as you looked ahead. Once we had been flying for a couple of hours, I realized that the man <laughs> sitting five rows in front of me was looking at me. I admit that it might have been paranoia because I was exhausted, and flying makes me anxious and the prospect of sitting in coach for ten hours fidgety and restless desperate for something I could fixate on. But the man sitting five seats down the aisle was making me nervous, and I couldn't brush that feeling aside. I don't know, I just had a bad feeling the moment I saw him. He had already been seated when I came into the plane, dragging my carry-on behind me as per usual. God, I fucking detest airplanes. I was stuck in the narrow corridor waiting for the guy in front of me to stop struggling with his oversized luggage inside the overhead compartment his wife cursing angrily at him in quick Spanish. I looked away, trying to keep my irritation under control. This was going to be a long flight, but it would feel longer if I couldn't keep calm. That was when I met the man's eyes. I couldn't begin to describe them. He had one of those normal faces, nothing remarkable or memorable about it. Plain brown hair, plain brown eyes, not too thin, not too fat. I don't even think I could easily pick him out of a lineup. I couldn't even tell if he looked sad or happy. Just very plain. Despite myself, I just smiled a little bit. We are all travelers in pain, aren't we? He didn't smile back. The guy in front of me cursed again and started trying to shove his carry-on luggage under the seat in front of him. I watched him for a while and when I looked around again, the unremarkable man was looking at me. Same blank expression as before, except for the smallest wrinkle in between his brows. The only indication of any kind of thought of feeling. It was impossible to read his face. But I couldn't help but think that I had piqued his interest. It was a relief when I was finally allowed to move along, leaving the man behind. I found my seat, stored my bag above my head and my purse under the seat before me. Then put on my headphones and tried not to think too much about how I couldn't stop a plane from crashing 
or how much I hated when things were out of my control. Having the aisle seat, I could see the man, his fingers drumming the armrest as people poured into the plane. In between bodies and luggage, I think I caught a glimpse of him turning his face around, trying to get a glimpse of me. But he didn't do it again once the plane took off. I guess it's difficult to be a creep when you're trapped in a flying metal box. I did see him glance my way once, but after that, he started fumbling with his phone, so he might be distracted. I couldn't tell where he was from. That was a direct flight from Toronto to Sao Paulo. So, most of the passengers were Brazilian tourists or immigrants, such as myself, going back to visit their friends and family. The guy didn't look like anything, so he could be Brazilian, I suppose, or Canadian. There are some pretty weird types in Toronto. Maybe I told myself as I watched him fumble with the phone. Maybe he is just a nervous passenger, like myself someone who hates flying just as much as I do and is just heading to a Brazilian beach to escape a harsh Canadian winter. And that was when I realized his phone was off. He'd had it out for at least an hour, tilting the screen one way or another. But the screen was pitch black. He didn't have headphones or AirPods on, and he surely wasn't playing a game. He wasn't even watching a movie. For the last hour, he had been using his phone as a mirror to look at me. Somehow, I was his in-flight entertainment. Don't look worried, I told myself. Looking worried would make me look weak, and I didn't want him to think of me as an easy target. I sat there for a moment, my heartbeat picking up pace as I considered my options. Most people will tell you to call attention to a creep that is making you uncomfortable. And I would usually agree, but this wasn't some gross drunk asshole on the subway trying to put a hand under my skirt. I wasn't entirely sure the guy was doing anything, and the last thing I wanted was to be the hysterical woman making a scene. Discreetly, I grabbed my purse and walked towards the washroom in the back of the plane, but I didn't go. Instead, I looked in the galley for a flight attendant. Is there a way to change seats? I asked him. He looked mildly annoyed because this was a busy flight, and there weren't many unoccupied seats. Once I explained the reason, though, his eyebrows shot up. The guy on 26H? I was a little relieved. If he had noticed, then maybe I wasn't being as paranoid as I thought. Yeah, that one. He looked in that direction, mild annoyance turning into impatience. Then he said, I think there's an empty seat in the back of the plane. I thanked him and took my seat in the last row. The turbulence was going to make me nauseous, but at least I would feel safer with some distance between me and that creep. I settled in, had my shitty airplane dinner, listened to a few episodes of a funny podcast on my phone, and slowly felt myself relax. I even managed to fall asleep. Sometime later, I cracked my eyes open again and... Shit, fuck! My heart felt as it was going to leap out of my mouth. He was staring at me again, except this time, he wasn't even trying to be discreet. He was just standing there, on the other side of the aisle, looking at me over the sleeping heads of the other passengers. Maybe it would have been wiser to pretend that I was asleep, but I didn't want him to think he could intimidate me. So I loudly asked, You need something! With enough volume and indignation that I attracted the attention of a couple of passengers. I saw the sympathetic flight attendant walk towards him. The man didn't even flinch. His eyes still on mine. He <laughs> smiled. It was the first hint of any emotion that I had seen on his face, and I didn't like it. He looked smug, as if he knew a secret that I hadn't figured out yet. Before the flight attendant could say anything, the man turned and walked away. The flight attendant was kind enough to ask if I wanted to move again, but I didn't think it would make much of a difference. One of the perks of flying is that there is nowhere to run, but there was also nothing the man could do to me. It was another four hours before we landed and, until then, the man didn't bother me, nor did I leave my seat. I wasn't about to risk it. Once we landed, I waited for everyone else to leave the plane so that I could keep an eye out for him. From the back of the plane, I managed to catch a glimpse of his orange shirt as he left, but he didn't look back once. Once I knew that he was gone and the aisles were finally clear of other passengers, 
I thanked the flight attendant and went back to my original seat to fetch my carry-on luggage. I wasn't in a hurry to catch my connection, which would depart in three hours. But the Garaljos International Airport is one of the least reliable airports I have ever seen. Once I got my luggage, I would have to go through customs, then check my luggage again, then rush to the other side of the airport to catch a domestic flight, all of which should take me at least one hour, if not more, depending on how many people were flying. I was worried about all of that, but all of those worries faded away because I realized something while taking my carry-on from the overhead compartment. The tag was missing. The tag with my full name, phone number, and address. Everything that a person would need if they wanted to find me. That was three weeks ago, and I'm about to get on the flight back to Toronto. But I don't know what I'm going to do once I get there. I'm scared of going home. Growing up, my mother, Evelyn, absolutely detested me. I was an only child and it was made very clear that I was, as she put it, the worst mistake she had ever made. I know the circumstances of my birth by heart as she practically branded the words into my brain. My mother was 19, beautiful and free, brilliant, she told me, in a beauty pageant starlet. She had just won Miss Bricktown and was on her way to becoming Miss Oklahoma. That was, of course, until she fell ill. By falling ill, she meant she was pregnant with me. She told me I ruined her. I stole her from the spotlight. I sucked the life out of her with everything it took to birth and raise me. What she won't tell you is that she didn't just fall ill. She fell right into a male judge who promised her a shining crown. If you ask her though, she'll never admit it. Hell, in her eyes, I might as well have been some twisted immaculate conception. From this, you can guess just how horrible my childhood was. She spit venom every time she spoke to me, and though she never hit me, she knew how to instill a deeper, more personal pain. I did whatever I could to try and impress her, clubs, sports, I was even student body president, but nothing worked. She detested me and viewed me only as a thing that ruined her life. The final straw was when I turned 16. At this age, I had finally well matured and began to take after my mother's looks. She must have noticed, because one day after school I came home to a large, frilly pink dress sitting on my bed. She had signed me up for some beauty pageant two towns over. This is when I finally had enough. I was not going to let her ignore and berate me my whole life and then suddenly try and live vicariously through me. Absolutely not. I emancipated, cut off all contact, and began living with a friend of mine. I graduated, went to college, got married, I have a lovely life that never existed under her roof. Now, I am 26 and just have my first child, a baby girl I named Lydia. Last night, the message came in from a number I didn't recognize. Adriana, it's Evelyn. You should be receiving my package any day now. I stared at my phone, dumbfounded. I had changed my number several times in the last 10 years and had no living relatives anymore to give her my new one. I collected myself and replied, Who is this actually? Is this some kind of sick joke? The next text came in quickly. I see you've never lost your attitude, did you? I will be visiting soon to meet my sweet granddaughter, XOXO, Mimi. I knew it wasn't true. She didn't even know what state I lived in, let alone my address. I didn't know who was pulling such a sick prank on me, but I blocked the number promptly. In the next couple days, I quickly forgot about the exchange. The number was blocked and that was it. That was until I opened my door one evening and found a small lavender box on my front porch. On top of the box was a glittery bow with a note tied to it reading, To Lydia, Love Mimi. No shipping label, no return address, just those four horrifying words. With shaking hands, I brought the box inside and untied the ribbons, keeping it together. Inside was a bright pink, frilly dress, the same one my mother bought for me when I was 16. Only this one was small enough to fit a very young child in. My hand shut over my mouth in horror. Whoever was pulling this twisted little stunt had taken it too far. This was sick. I grabbed my phone and dialed my husband as quickly as I could. The call failed immediately. He had gone on some stupid bachelor party ski trip and, just my luck, had no service. No, my husband wasn't enough. I went to dial 911 before the next text came in from another unrecognized number. A lovely dress for the future starlet. It's important to start training them early. I'll be there shortly to help out. XOXO, Mimi. Listen here, you sick freak. I type vigorously. 
I don't know who you are or what game you're playing, but you better leave my family alone before I get the cops involved. I blocked the number again. I felt exhausted and sick. I hoped that the threat of police would be enough for this to stop. I grabbed Lydia from her playpen and held her in my arms tight before hauling the two of us into my bed and going to sleep. I decided that my little girl was not leaving my sight until this whole thing blew over. I'll admit, even if I did think it was a joke, I was getting uneasy. That unease grew into genuine fear the following morning. I awoke to my daughter crying, burrowed in my chest. I pried open my sleep crested eyes and immediately did a double take. Perched on top of my baby's head was a small, silver tiara. I could feel acid rising in my throat at the sight. I knew it wasn't ours as I refused to get my daughter anything even slightly related to pageantry due to the trauma of my youth. I jumped out of bed and practically sprinted to my front door. It was wide open. Someone had been in my home. The only people who knew the keypad lock code were my husband and I. How had someone been in my home? I called the police. They showed up and inspected my home. All that they could tell me was that if nothing was stolen, then I should get security cameras and install new locks. Pissed was an understatement, but I did as they instructed. The new lock would be here the day after tomorrow and the cameras would be here next week. This was too long for comfort. Things were clearly escalating and I didn't know if I even had until the day after tomorrow. What that even meant, I hardly knew. I was in a panicked frenzy. I had barely hit submit order when the next message came in, again, from a new unknown number. You are being very rude, AD. I will see my grandbaby whether you like it or not, and I will be damned if I let some silly lock keep me out. This is my right. You may have ruined me, but I will not let you ruin that little girl too. This time I fully threw up. 80. It was a name only my mother called me as a child. I had never used it with anyone else. No one else could have known this sick little pet name. This no longer felt like a trick. The truth boiled up like last night's dinner. This was her. My mother had found me after all these years. Through welling tears, I replied, I don't know how you found me, and I don't care. This is my family, not yours. If you come anywhere near my daughter again, I swear to God, I will kill you. The next text came in only moments later. You can try. I will see you this evening for dinner. XOXO. Mimi. I spent the rest of the day in a panic. I barricaded every door and window into my house. I was taking absolutely no chances. What the hell was I so scared of? At this point, she must have been 45. Surely I would be able to overpower her if it came to that, right? I put my daughter down to bed at 7.30. After triple checking that there was no way in or out of this house, I sat in my kitchen, a knife clutched in my hand, watching the front lawn. As expected, another text came in. This text was a single image, an image of my home. An image of me in the window, eyes filled with fear. Another message came in that simply read, I'm here. My animal instincts kicked in. If she was here, I was going to face her. By God, I was absolutely not going to be afraid of this woman. I would not allow her any more control over my life. I was going to end this. I pulled the armchair out from in front of the door, tearing apart my barricade I had been so worried about before and stormed into my front lawn, knife still in hand. That's when I saw her. She was standing unmoving, unblinking in my neighbor's front lawn directly across the street wearing my pink frilly dress and an impossibly tall silver crown. As I walked closer, I began to realize something was horribly, horribly wrong with her. The dress she was wearing looked torn to shreds. It was covered in deep brown stains and I swear I could smell it from where I stood. Not only that, but she was completely deformed. Her once long blonde curly hair was now matted and gray. It looked as though it had begun falling out of her head in clumps, leaving large bald patches. She was impossibly thin, her now pale yellow tinged skin stretched paper thin over sharp bone. There were green pus filled pockets along her arms and legs that looked almost like mold. Then her face, oh dear god, her face. It was like something from a horror movie. Her lips seemed to have receded, showing thick black gums and yellow cracked teeth. The lack of lip did not stop her from painting a cherry red ring around her perpetual smile. Her eyes seemed to have shrunk back into their sockets. 
Smoky eye makeup made them look like deeply bruised pits. She raised a single rotting hand and gave me a beauty queen wave, turning her wrist back and forth. I let out a blood curdling scream before quickly turning around and bolting back inside. I slammed the door behind me, returned the armchair into its defensive position, and ran to my kitchen window, but she was gone. I thought of calling the police, but they had been useless already. No, this was my fight and something inside of me knew it, but oh god, what was wrong with her? For the first time in my life, I decided to look my mother up on the internet. I don't know what compelled me to do it, but I had to know what was happening. I couldn't just wait here like a sitting duck for that monster to come back. I typed her name into the search bar. The first few articles were all old, simple retellings of her pageant winnings and interviews from 10 years ago. Then I saw an article from this year, two months ago to be exact. It was a scanned image of a newspaper article, far smaller and less extravagant than the others, from her youth, crammed into the bottom of the page. The article detailed a couple who was taking a morning walk when they stumbled upon an unmoving body. I'll give you two guesses as to who it was, but I'll bet you only need one. She had overdosed. She was a crackhead. My mother. My perfect, ever bragging mother, a crackhead. More importantly than that, she was dead. Only she wasn't dead, she was outside. I just saw her living and breathing. I tried to rationalize, only to realize that that thing I saw outside could not have been living and breathing. My breath shortened, my stomach emptied onto the kitchen floor once again. My heart began to beat out of its chest when the last message came in. I'm coming in now. I am going to see my grandbaby. Exo, Exo. Mimi. I'm sitting here now in my daughter's room trying not to wake her. I can feel the tears streaking down my face. This last message came in five minutes ago and the knocking started two minutes ago. I can't move. I'm frozen with fear. My poor baby is sleeping soundly behind me with no clue as to what horrors are happening around her. I don't know what to do. My mother's knocks have finally ceased. I can hear her punching the keypad. It's too late. She, that thing, is here. She found me. I still have my knife. I hope to God that I have the strength to use it. Lydia, if by some miracle you find this someday, please know that I love you and that I plan to go out fighting to protect you. I am so sorry. My first true crime novel was published in early 2011. The book followed the four-year career of a serial killer in southern Illinois, covering the grisly details of his murders and eventually ending with his arrest. The book was absolutely perfect. I poured hundreds of hours into research, interviews, and writing. I was convinced that it was a sure ticket into a life as a famous author. My publisher had other plans. They claimed that money was far too tight and that they had to cancel my marketing campaign. It was just a coincidence that they abandoned me just as they pushed hundreds of thousands of dollars resources towards another author. So of course, my novel failed. Of course, no one bought it. And if there's one thing publishers avoid more than unpublished amateurs, it's authors with a single failed book. I've spent the last few years trying to cobble something together that might convince them to give me another chance. When I heard about a string of murders in my town, it seemed the perfect opportunity for a comeback. I poured myself another glass of whiskey by the light of my computer monitor. My ice cube had melted three glasses back, but no matter. I couldn't slow my research into the killer's background, his victims, his method of murder, all of it. I took a sip as I reread another police report. The killer had used a fire axe to commit the crimes. Very gory. That was good. Gory murders always sell better than boring firearm related crimes. Even better was the fact that he'd killed families instead of single people. That was yet another angle I could exploit. I clicked on a news clip from the night he'd been arrested. The best part of this case was the fact that the lunatic had turned himself in. I drained the rest of my glass, already planning what I write about that. Family serial killer with a conscience? I made a list of names to contact the next day. The police raid on the killer's apartment had been highly publicized, so I knew exactly where he lived. I looked up the landlord who owned the apartment complex and wrote his number down on a little notebook I carry around with me. A few well-placed lies might get me a tour of the killer's private quarters. I woke up the next morning with a splitting headache and nausea. 
but I didn't let that slow me down. I rolled over, took a shower, and went out to meet with the landlord of the apartment. He was a tall, portly man in his late 40s. He seemed friendly and more than a little stupid. He unlocked the door for me and showed me a few of the rooms. The apartment had been almost completely cleared out by someone. I guess first the police and then the movers. I nodded along as the landlord continued the tour of the apartment, showing me the kitchen, then the master bedroom. I knew the killer had a habit of hiding bodies inside crawl spaces from my research and was on the lookout for them. I noticed a vent in the corner of the master bedroom that looked to be pressure fit into the wall. Seems like a great place, just the kind of thing I've been looking for, I said, wiping away the post-drinking sweats that were growing on my forehead. You mind if I use the bathroom before we finish here? The landlord pointed to the master bathroom. Be my guest. I purposefully spent a long time in there hoping he'd leave the bedroom. I was rewarded when he called out, I'll be by my car downstairs when you're finished. I left the bathroom and crept up to the vent. I pulled hard on the metal and was rewarded as it slid smoothly from the wall. Inside was a space about two feet wide and one foot tall. It extended back into the darkness for several feet at least. And there, lying in the dust on the metal floor, was a leather-bound notebook. I snatched it from the ground, hardly believing my luck. It was thick and well used, but I stuffed it inside my shirt for the time being. Replacing the metal grate was harder than pulling it off, but I managed it without making too much noise. I returned to the landlord outside, turning to look up at the small apartment. I'm gonna be honest with you, I said. How's that, he asked, confused. I'm Jim Sullivan, a true crime novelist, I said. I'm here to find out if there's anything interesting left about your most recently departed tenant. The landlord's face clouded over with anger. So this was a waste of my time then? I was wondering if you had any information about not for liars, get off my property. I never want to see you here again. I thanked him and returned to my car, my mind already on nothing but the thick leather booklet inside my shirt. I rushed home, guarding the notebook like a goose with a golden egg. I prepared my desk with a spiral notebook and a blue pen ready by my right hand. Then, trembling, I opened the notebook. It was far better and far worse than I could have ever imagined. The killer had written his planning of the murders in excruciating detail. He explained how he watched the houses, how he waited to see whether or not the husbands loved their wives whether or not the children were disobedient, what kind of dinners they ate, and at what time, he must have stalked them for days beforehand. But the details in the planning were nothing to the details in describing the murders themselves. I had to pause halfway through reading one account. He kept describing the look on the father's face as his wife died. I poured myself a tall drink, drained it, then poured myself another. The killer languished in the description of their cries their last dying moments, their pitiful supplication for mercy. I finished the bottle before I finished the notebook. After his account of the fourth family murder, the pages of the book finally, mercifully, went blank. When he finished describing the desecration of the last corpse, I closed the book with trembling fingers. My head throbbed with alcohol and the horrible images racing through my mind, but I couldn't help but hold my hands to my mouth in joy. What a find! What a treasure trove of information! A hundred years of interviews couldn't give me what this one book had just dropped into my lap. I was going to be famous again! I laughed out loud into the empty room, picked up the already empty bottle of whiskey to my lips, and licked at the last drop before walking to my bedroom. I woke up late the next afternoon feeling woozy. I felt something worse than a hangover. Must have drunk more than I'd been planning to. But could anyone really blame me, reading those horrible things I'd read? No, of course, no one could blame me. In fact, no one could blame me if I had another drink right now to ease this horrible throbbing in my skull. I got to my feet and walked to the kitchen. I cracked open a beer before walking back to my desk. The notebook caught my eyes as I passed. It was different, somehow thicker. I picked it up and realized that my blue pen had been lodged inside of the leather-bound notebook. I opened it up and saw a brand new entry that hadn't been there the night before. I sat down at the desk, trying to make sense of this new entry, written in a different handwriting from the others. My blood ran cold as I realized what I was reading. I read, 
in similar meticulous detail how I had gone to a house up in the mountains and killed a young couple on their honeymoon. I read about how I'd killed the husband and that I had taken the wife's body back with me. I immediately jumped to my feet and ran to my computer, googling the address furiously. Had I written this in some kind of murder and alcohol-induced sleepwalking? The address was real. It was a house just a half hour away, and there were no news articles about any murders in the area. My breathing continued to quicken as I stared at the house. The descriptions from the notebook matched it perfectly. It wasn't necessarily my handwriting, but there's no doubt it was different from the other entries, and it had been written with my pen. I googled the nearest payphone, marked the location, and drove there. I dialed 911 with a gloved hand. 911, what's your emergency? A voice on the other end asked. Can you send someone over to a house for me? I'm concerned that something bad may have happened. Sir, what do you- I cut her off, instead passing the address. Did you get that? I asked. I- she said. I read the address again, then hung up. I drove back to my house, thinking hard the entire way. God, I needed a drink. My garage door opened up and I drove inside. It was only then that I noticed the axe on the ground. I closed the garage door and rounded my car. An unfamiliar axe lay on the ground beside the door to my house. I knelt down and picked it up to inspect it. The metal head was crusted with a layer of blood and hair. I stumbled back, holding my hand to my mouth. When no monster leapt from the darkness, I dropped the axe to the floor and walked inside to open another bottle. I spent the next hour constantly refreshing the news and praying for what must have been the first time in years. Please, I begged. Please, let this be some big misunderstanding. Please. It only took three hours before the double homicide was front page news. I was already in an alcohol-fueled haze at that point. Every single detail was correct. Husband dead, wife missing. I realized then that I hadn't looked around my house. The wife's body was somewhere after all. Wouldn't she be in the house of her killer? The notebook had been silent on her final location. I spent the next hour looking through my house for places where I may have stashed her body, but came up short. A strange, bizarre revulsion to the notebook came over me. It had caused this. I wasn't sure how, but I knew that if I'd never picked it up, I wouldn't have had that axe in my garage, nor a conscience so weighted down by. No, that wasn't possible. I had to get rid of it. I briefly considered burning the notebook, but rejected the idea. No. Something told me that the book belonged back in the apartment where I found it. I drank a shot of espresso to sober up, then started walking. The apartment was just a few blocks away, and I figured I'd already killed enough people for one day. The night was cold, but I barely felt the chill through the haze of guilt, confusion, and fear. I reached the killer's apartment 20 minutes later. One of the windows on the ground floor was unlocked, which allowed me to slide inside. I closed it behind me and looked around at the apartment. The other killer had turned himself in, hadn't he? He'd had a conscience. My mouth turned down into a snarl. It wasn't my fault, even if I did do it. It was the damn notebook. I pulled it out and threw it onto the ground. After a moment of hesitation, I scooped it back up and walked up the dark stairs to the master bedroom. It was the same as I'd left it the day before, though the vent looked off. Maybe the landlord had noticed I'd messed with it. No matter. I knelt down and pulled hard on the vent, earning a cut on my thumb as the metal slid free. I reached down and grabbed the notebook, then extended my arm into the darkness where I hit something soft and wet. I flipped on my phone's light and saw the body of a woman lying inside, covered in enough blood to leave the scent of iron in the air. I stumbled back, trying to make sense of it. Surely I hadn't killed this woman, then driven to the house, right? Then my thought from earlier returned to me. The woman's body was almost certainly on the killer's property. The front door of the apartment below me opened with a crash. I spun and backed up, still on my hands and knees as the sound of slow, steady footsteps climbed up the stairs. The bedroom door opened and the light flicked on. The landlord I'd met the other day stood in the doorway holding an axe covered in still wet blood. Well, I'm sad to say you weren't at home this time, he said, gripping the head of the axe with a beefy fist. You're probably wondering what the hell's going on. Am I right? He pointed the handle of the axe towards me. Am I right? I nodded slowly, my mind racing. He hefted the axe in his hands. There's just something about convincing other people that they're killers. Not even the light leaving someone's eyes gives me the rush I felt when that 
poor sap turned himself in. Sorry, liar. You just happened to be the next to pick up the book. But you made it easy. You even gave me your name. Looks like I'll have to leave that notebook out for someone else to find. Maybe a detective will wake up to find he's killed his wife. What do you think? He took a step into the room. I jumped to my feet and ran for the bathroom. I knew from my time there earlier that it had a window. I'd only made it a few feet before the axe slammed into the back of my left arm. I ignored the pain and leapt at the window, crossed my arms into an X, and crashed through the glass. The fall was just long enough for me to reflect on my poor decisions before I hit the ground. A dozen things inside me broke with the impact, but that wasn't what worried me. What worried me was that I'd hear heavy footsteps again. But I didn't hear footsteps. I heard a cry of surprise. A young couple ran over to me. Are you okay? The man shouted. The last thing I heard before losing consciousness was the wife calling the police. I'll skip over my stay in the hospital, the police's fruitless search for the landlord, and my panic attacks. They still haven't found him, and I don't think I'll be able to sleep until they do. I let the police take copies of the notebook, but I still own the original. And I'm not going to lie to you. I still occasionally check the ending to make sure no new entries have shown up. I noticed it first on a Monday after an unusually brutal shift at work. Customers hounding me for refills, sauce on the side, extra napkins. You know how it is. That day was especially bad because I had one guy try the dollar bill trick on me. You know the one. He set out five ones and took away a dollar every time I messed up or wasn't fast enough. I wasn't angry at him for taking any away, only that he expected me to bend over backwards for five fucking dollars. Get real. After dealing with all of that, the last thing I wanted to see on my way to the front door was a creepy old man staring at me. He had been my duplex neighbor for over five years. Most people wouldn't live in a duplex for so long, but we only shared one wall with each other and he was always very timid. The only sounds I heard through the wall were his low humming to jazz tunes and the clinking of pots as he cooked. This was his daily routine after spending hours in the garden talking to his flowers. He was a little off, sure, but he was very sweet. He respected my privacy and never approached me aside from the occasional hello. Things changed a lot when his grandson moved in. Of the few conversations we had, he had not once mentioned a family. That's why I thought it was strange to see a chalky, scruffy, 20-something man dragging a suitcase into the unit beside me on a warm Wednesday afternoon. I didn't ask who he was, but when he saw me reclining on my patio chair, he perked up with a, Oh, you must be my new neighbor. My name is Cameron. He told me all about how much he missed his grandfather after so many years and how he was too elderly to be living alone. Something about him seemed... Uh, off. I can't describe it, but it wasn't my business, so I brushed it off. Suddenly, I was seeing more and more of Cameron, and less and less of my elderly neighbor. He was no longer spending time in the garden. I could no longer hear the faint jazz through the walls. Instead, I heard whirring of tools every night until 11pm, like a late night remodel was happening next door. Honestly, it was so faint, it never bothered me. At one point, those noises stopped too, and that's when I saw my elderly neighbor again. I stepped out of my car one day and began walking towards my front door when I caught something in the corner of my eye. The sunlight was hitting my neighbor's window at the perfect angle where I could hardly see anything but bright, flooding yellow. I squinted hard to make out the shape. All I could see was a figure standing behind the window, perfectly still. I decided not to dwell on it too much and went inside but something about that sent a chill down my spine and lingered in my thoughts. As I lay in bed, I still couldn't forget about it. The next day, I glanced over at my neighbor's window, but the curtains were drawn. Well, maybe it was my imagination. So I went off to work like usual. Once I came home, he was standing there, staring, waiting behind his large glass window, his loose, draping skin accentuated by the fact he was completely nude. He stared at me with hazy eyes and a sick expression on his face. It made me gag. I knew he was standing there for me. 
I had been coming home at the same time every day for years. I remained frozen, unsure of if I should head inside or get in my car and drive somewhere far away. In the end, I decided I may have been overreacting. Cameron had told me a few days prior that the old man was suffering from dementia, which worsened every day. I didn't want to do anything rash, especially since my sweet neighbor was sick. He probably wasn't standing there on purpose. I decided to let it go. But days turned into weeks, and the old man was waiting by the window every day. Even when I changed shifts, he was always there, waiting. Sometimes he was sitting on his satin chair with a cup of tea. But certain things remained the same, such as his naked, forever drooping skin and his hazy expression. Sometimes it felt like he grinned at me as I walked by. Nights felt uncomfortably cold as his loud breathing echoed through our shared wall. It felt as if he was always watching, even when he wasn't by the window. I never saw him come out of the house. I don't know if he ever left. Only Cameron would leave occasionally to gather groceries and come home whistling tunes on his way in. I tried to avoid looking at the old man as much as possible, but I noticed how sickly he became. Once, I leered a little longer near my door to see if he would turn to watch me leave. That day he was just standing there, unmoving, his skin drooping almost to the floor. I don't know why I knocked on his door. I don't know if I was worried about him or fed up. I just knew I couldn't take much more of the staring. It was driving me crazy. It only took two knocks before Cameron opened the door. Hey, Rye, what can I help you with? He said nonchalantly. Rye. Only my friends call me Rye. Who does this guy think he is calling me that when we've only exchanged a few sentences to each other? That really irritated me and I became a little more aggressive. Can I come in? I need to talk to you. I was unwilling to hide the agitation in my voice. He whistled. Now really isn't the time. Can I invite you over for dinner later? No, we need to talk now. I was beginning to push my way in when I stopped. I saw something in my peripheral that made my stomach turn. I looked up at Cameron my fearful expression crystal clear in his dilated pupils. His breathing became heavy. He looked excited. He reached out to grab me, but I was too fast. I ran into my unit and tightly locked the door. With trembling fingers, I dialed 911. Thump, thump, thump. Cameron was hitting hard against our shared wall. Come back, let's have dinner. His muffled voice somehow carried into my living room. I tried to keep my composure so I could describe to the 911 operator exactly what I saw at my neighbor's house. Once they informed me the police would arrive in 15 minutes, I grabbed a knife from the kitchen and huddled into a corner of my living room. Cameron was still pounding against the wall, repeating the same five words. After about 10 minutes, he stopped. Silence. Then I heard the creaking of the neighbor's back door. It's funny how many small sounds you can make out when your senses are in survival mode. I sat, praying that he wouldn't try to come into my home. It was dark now, and the silence had filled with the chirping of crickets. My prayers were answered when I saw glaring red and blue lights approach our driveway. Loud knocking nearly made me jump out of my skin. I slowly approached the window and let out a sigh of relief when I saw the cop standing there. I cautiously opened the door. Ma'am, you called about some suspicious activity next door? My neighbor's skin, I whispered. The fear had managed to take my voice away to where I could barely speak. What? The policemen looked at each other in confusion. I pointed at the window attached to my neighbor's unit. Unlike other nights, the curtains were wide open and the silhouette of the old man's draping body stood behind the window. The police scurried over to the neighbor's unit and disappeared behind the door. I watched from the other side of the window as one of the policemen turned my elderly neighbor around. From my view, I could see all of the stitching on his back. A poorly sewn-on zipper adorned the center so that his skin could be worn like a sick, repulsive costume. I couldn't take it anymore. 
I let out all the vomit I had been holding back up to this point. The police didn't seem too pleased with their discovery either. Cameron, if that even was his real name, was never caught. I described him to the police, but his face was the type that didn't stand out at all. If I were to try and pick him out of a crowd, I'm not confident I could. He wasn't my neighbor's grandson, obviously. Sadly, my neighbor didn't have a family, but he seemed happy by himself up until, you know. I had seen the old man a few times after Cameron moved in, but he was acting strange. I wish I had paid attention back then. I don't blame myself, but I do feel regret for the way things turned out. One thing's for sure, though. I'm never living so close to a neighbor again. I come from a small mining town in Arizona where there is not a lot to do except hike. It was a good but boring area to grow up. Our population was small with little to no crime. My father owned the quarry where a majority of the community's economic strain came from. He left me with a sizable inheritance after he passed away. I bought a truck and a house out in the plains with a basketball court and a pool. That was the sole extent of my lavish spending, but it was all I needed. Unless you count pizza. I don't have many vices to blow my fortune on. I've never been an avid party goer, luckily. Like a lot of people my age, one indulgence I did have was watching YouTube. Urban exploration became a most searched category of mine from 2009 on. I became a subscriber of a content creator and urbex vlogger named Isolation Infinity. He kept himself anonymous and did not show his face. He used footage of the haunts he went into as captured by the body camera strapped to his chest. His voice's baritone became a signature element of the channel. He traveled all over the world and went into many chilling places. These included vacant hospitals, asylums, morgues, and train stations. He even stumbled upon a murder in progress once. A homeless man had stomped another transient to death in a farmhouse. He uploaded edited parts of it. This was a controversial decision. It almost resulted in a lifetime ban for him from the platform. The clips did not help law enforcement later on, nonetheless. He was also arrested a few times for trespassing on famous estates. The Houdini mansion in Los Angeles was one of them, but none of his fans held this against him. We respected him for being willing to get into trouble with the law in pursuit of the next viral video. Late last year, Isolation Infinity announced that he was going to have a live face reveal. It was only going to be for his patrons, i.e. those who gave money to his Patreon account. I contributed funds to it on a monthly basis. I viewed him as a pioneer of his entertainment niche and did not mind sparing a little change. He emailed me and told me I was one of a dozen allowed to attend a live event. He further stated it would be in a password-protected chat room. He also promised an exclusive video which would not make it onto the public video lineup. I was more interested in the latter than the former. I never cared what his appearance was since I already had a vision of someone my age in their mid to late 20s. It was hard to convince me he looked any different from the picture in my mind's eye. Still, I was not going to turn down the chance to find out. Being able to brag to his diehard followers who did not get to experience it would be worth it alone. The night of the scheduled face reveal, I booted up my PC. I kicked back on a lounge chair in the second story room of my house, which was my entertainment space. It was complete with the video game consoles and my beloved Alienware computer, an open bag of pepper jerky and a bottle of ginger ale set next to my keyboard. I went into my email, the password was in my inbox. I followed the link, it led me to the video of a room with nothing in it but a red wall with a baby blue frame. The caption isolation infinity will be on shortly rested at the bottom of the screen. I expected a home studio and instead got what appeared to be someone's dingy basement in need of a new coat of paint. What bothered me the most was the sound of heavy machinery whirring in the background. I wrote it off as bad plumbing. A man came into the frame. He was slim and wore a trench coat with maroon buttons on its front. He reached down, grabbed the lens of the camera, and shifted it upward. The familiar voice we had all grown fond of started to count down. Are you ready to see who I am? Isolation Infinity asked. One, two, three, four... At five, he hosted it upwards and pointed it at his face. I froze. He looked nothing like what I had visualized. He was hairless, emaciated, pale, and had marble black eyes. He reminded me of Werner Krauss from the old German 1920 film, The Cabinet of Dr. Caligari. His mouth hung open and tilted to the side as if he could not control the movement of his jaw. The most alarming thing to me was not how his features were not flattering, 
That explained why he valued being off camera for most of his career. What upset me the most in the beginning was how the disparity in his perceived age made me feel lied to. He always told his fans he was a young man, like most of his demographic. The individual before me on the screen was in his 50s at the earliest. I have been fantasizing about broadcasting this for a long time, he said as he licked his lips. You have made this possible, and so I need to show my appreciation by giving thanks in the most sincere way I know how. He moved the camera to the left, and I could not believe what I saw. A woman in her 30s sat on a grimy floor, her head down from evident exhaustion. Rusted chains circled her arms. She wore a tattered black top as though someone's knife or nails had left wounds on portions of her torso. Stains were on her clothes. She had spent time in the dirt fighting someone or clawing her way out of a soiled embankment before this. Say something, he ordered her. Tell them you can't wait to die. The blades of a chainsaw came into view and its motor revved. She whimpered with pain, and when she tried to murmur something, I saw blood drip from her mouth. I dragged the mouse cursor over to the right-hand side of the screen to see how many people were in the chat. The answer I received left me weak. No one else was there but me. The others had either left or were never there to begin with, and I was too stupid to notice until then. My heartbeat increased as I tried to close the window out. I could not. The X symbol on the right hand side was visible but useless. It was like every virus infected pop up ad you could not escape from. What? Infinity Isolation asked. You don't like it, Mark? Everything I do is to make my most devoted subscribers happy. A chill ran through me. He knew my name. It took me a second to realize he had gotten it through my membership to his Patreon. The fact that he was aware of how I was his only viewer worried me. Was I going to be the sole witness to a barbaric act of murder? Calm down, I reassured myself. This is an elaborate prank he's recording right now. He's wearing scary Hollywood makeup and she's an actress. This is all for the sake of getting more views. The chainsaw has to be a prop bought off Etsy.com. Still, my hand inched towards the phone to call 911. The way the woman expressed her misery in the moment was all too convincing. I held my device closer to my ear. I wouldn't do that if I was you, Mark. He stared right at the screen for a moment, his eyes making perfect contact with mine. Can he see me? He lifted the chainsaw above the woman's head. He brought it down with a noise from his throat which sounded like a cross between a scream and a laugh. A fountain of gore spurted out. The lens got hit with crimson bubbles. He cackled as I unplugged my monitor. I carried it downstairs to my car and drove to the nearest police station. I filled out an incident report in an office with a dying lamp and the scowl of a detective facing me. He looked as though he would have rather been anywhere else but at work. For the first two hours there, I had to convince them that I was not a crazy person. They thought I was there to waste their time with a fanciful tale of my correspondence with some creep. I hope it was all a hoax, I said. If this is not real, no one would be happier about it than me. Here's my computer. See if you can't trace where he's at in case it... I gagged before I could complete my thought. The idea of it being authentic was overwhelming. They had cyber crimes go over everything and a few days later I got my PC back. It took about a week before I received a call from someone working the case. She was a homicide investigator named Samantha Brown. We found the killer was streaming from a bunker in Virginia, she said. It's an old fallout shelter abandoned since the Cold War. He calls himself the I-73 Butcher, since that highway is his preferred route. He uses it as a screen name on the dark web. Infinity Isolation is a serial killer? I asked, feeling a knot in my stomach. No, she said. The real Isolation Infinity is someone else. This maniac poses as famous people. He uses a combination of tools including voice altering software and encrypted Wi-Fi. He hacks into their accounts. He gets a thrill out of making complete strangers watch his acts of terror. His tech savvy ways also allows him to control other people's webcams, and we don't know how many he has breached. He is on several most wanted lists of different agencies. We have never found out what he looks like. The faces he uses on those terrible live streams are prosthetic. He has maintained a stringent anonymity and avoided the news cycle. I'm sorry you saw such torment. The good part is, you turning in your computer helped us at least find out his last known whereabouts. 
The scene searched and we have some evidence. He's still out there somewhere? For now. I went to bed that night with a host of emotions. I felt violated by a complete monster that sabotaged my privacy. Moreover, I felt dumb for getting swindled. I still feel shivers over the fact that he is not apprehended. Word of what happened got to the real isolation infinity, who, as of late, deleted his entire channel. Many speculated on how victims mistaking him for an insane person protrubed him. Sometimes, as I lay my head down and drift off to sleep, I hear a noise by my window. I jump up and think it's a chainsaw. Thus far, it has been a neighbor's lawnmower every time. I hope it stays that way. I lost my left eye when I was only seven years old. It was a stupid way to lose an eye. But luckily, most people tend not to ask how I lost it. I think the majority worry it might be insensitive. It's not a story I like to tell. Not because it's upsetting or brings back bad memories. I just feel embarrassed by it. Growing up, my brother and I were obsessed with Robin Hood, the outlaw of Sherwood Forest, who would take from the rich and give to the poor. I'm not going to pretend this heroic savior of the poor was our hero because of his good deeds. We simply liked him because of his legendary skill with a bow and arrow. Our father, a keen gardener, had lots of bamboo sticks all piled up beside the shed which he would tie plants to in order to stop them from drooping when they grew. It was my brother's idea to take one and attach a length of string to both ends to create a bow. I thought he was an absolute genius. When we had finished making the bow, we made an arrow simply by using a handsaw to carve a small groove into one end of an arrow-sized piece of bamboo, which would act as a nest for the string to sit. I'm first, my brother said. No, I cried. It was my idea, so I get to shoot first, and that was that. At one end of the garden, there was a little wall which surrounded one of my father's flower patches. Upon the wall, we placed an empty plastic bottle to be used as our target. My brother, of course, then took the first turn, missing wildly and falling far short of the bottle on the wall. Next, it was my go and I also missed. It took about an hour before we both had knocked the bottle off the wall once. Right, now you stand in the middle and I'll shoot over your head at the target. Another genius idea by my brother. I didn't argue. I thought it was a cool thing to do, and if I did it, then my brother would have to let me have a go shooting over him. I don't believe he meant to do it. It was just a careless accident, but the arrow never made it past my body. It struck me hard and deep in my left eye. Straight away, blood poured down my cheek and I screamed in agony. I spent a couple days in the hospital before doctors decided they would have to remove what was left of my eye. Until I was 12, I wore an eye patch but when I moved into secondary school, I decided to get my first glass eye to try and put an end to the pirate jokes. It might sound weird, but I loved my glass eye, and by the time I was 16 and leaving school, I had collected dozens, all different colors and designs. My missing eye stopped being something I tried to hide, and in a strange way became my kind of signature. Kids would say, have you seen the boy with a spiral in his eye? Or... Have you seen the lad with an eye like a cat? I enjoyed this. It allowed me to embrace my injury and make it part of my identity. I carried on collecting glass eyes for many years, always on the lookout for new designs or something different to what I already had. When I was 25, I discovered the dark web. A friend from my Dungeons & Dragons club told me about how he had used it to buy some sort of hallucinogenic. I didn't plan on using the dark web for anything like that. I was just intrigued by the idea of it. Once I was on, I started looking for stores. It was amazing and disgusting. People selling guns, drugs, services, and even other people. It made me feel a little bit ill knowing I was now a part of this strange, illicit world. I went on to one store page, which called itself Mr. Bubbles Objects of Trouble which was the first store I had come across which had a search bar, so I thought, fuck it, let's see if they have any. I typed in the words, glass eye. I didn't expect anything to come up, and I was rather surprised when a match popped up on my screen. The item was called, The Sight of Sin. 
which was simply a black eye with a small red number 7 on it. It pulled at my fancy, so I decided to buy it. I didn't truly expect it to show up, but one week later a package arrived and there it was. As customary with all my new eyes, I washed the eye in a solution to make sure it was clean. When washed, I put it in a case with the rest of my eyes and went back to watching television. The next morning, when I woke up, I thought I'd test out the new eye to see if it was a good fit to check how comfortable it was. It went in with ease and felt absolutely perfect, so I decided to leave it in for the rest of the day. Nothing strange happened at first. It was just my usual daily routine of having breakfast and doing some work on my laptop, but then the doorbell rang. As I opened the door, I immediately knew something wasn't right. I had double vision all of a sudden. There was only one man standing on my front doorstep trying to sell me solar panels, but I could see him twice. One image of him was completely ordinary, just the bloke dressed in a suit holding a brochure and telling me about how he can save me money on my electricity bill. But the other image, well, it was him, but dressed up in a gimp suit cracking a whip against the floor lustfully. I don't think I said a word to him, I just stared transfixed by what I was seeing. Eventually, I closed the door and stood there for a moment, trying to understand what had just happened. I passed it off at the time as just my mind playing tricks on me and that I must be overtired. I decided to have a nap. I was woken by a telephone call from my father asking if I was still coming to his house for dinner. I looked at the time and realized I was running late, so I grabbed my coat and flew out the door. On my way to my father's house, which is just a 10-minute walk down the road from mine, I walked past just one person, a lady, walking her dog, but again I was seeing double. In one image, she was completely ordinary, apart from being overweight. She was wearing a pink coat, and beside her, a dog trotted along minding its own business. But in another part of my vision, I could see her again, completely naked, eating tin dog food with a fork. Jellied meat dripped down onto her breasts, which she licked ravenously. I was almost sick. I thought about just going home and going back to bed, still trying to convince myself I was simply tired from working, but my father missed not having me at home, and I didn't want to let him down, though now I wish I did. Now, what happened next won't make much sense unless I explain something. When I was two years old, my mother died. I say died, she was killed whilst walking home from work one night on this very estate. Nobody has ever been caught in relation to her murder, but now I know exactly who took my mother from me. My father opened the door with a large grin on his face. Come in, son, he said cheerily, but I did not move. Besides, the image of my father standing in the doorway was another vision of him holding a knife and laying beneath him on the floor was my mother, soaked in blood, eyes vacant and still. I took a step back from my father and did not stop running until I had reached the front door of my house. Straight away, I went onto the dark web and searched for Mr. Bubbles' store, but it had gone, vanished like it had never been there. I didn't leave the house for a few days. I didn't answer the door. I didn't even pick up the phone. What I did was sit by the window looking out onto the street, watching the people walking past. I think I know what I am seeing now. It makes little sense, but it's the only thing I can think of which almost explains what I am seeing. Firstly, when I remove the glass eye, I no longer see two images of everyone. I only see one just like I always have. But when the eye is in, I see two visions of every person I look at in the flesh. Secondly, I think I know what I am seeing. I am seeing their sins. I know, that sounds utterly mad, but it's the only thing all this seems to point to. The name of the glass eye, the red number seven, and the grotesque and disturbing images I see. I believe it's their sins I am seeing with my new eye. I see the true hideous nature of people, the part of themselves they hide from everyone else. I know I could just take the eye out and forget about it, but I just can't bring myself to do this. I can't trust anybody without it. I can't see the real them. But seeing people's darkest secrets also leaves me alone, 
for once you see the hidden nature of someone, you never want to be close to them again. Many questions remain. Why does this eye allow me to see these things? Who made it? How did it end up on the dark web? I need to know the answer to these questions. So please, if anyone out there has any information on the eye, or if anyone has ever come across Mr. Bubbles' Objects of Trouble store, then please get in touch. Please. I'm probably breaking the law by writing this down. Of course, a priest is not allowed to tell anything that was said in confession, but I think this man is an exception. I need to tell someone. Anyone. I was a priest for quite a few years now, and I'd gotten used to the job. So when a man came into the church and went straight for the confession booth, I wasn't surprised at all. He didn't introduce himself, but that was not unusual either. Some people preferred total anonymity when they confessed their sins. I didn't get to see him properly. He wore a gray sweater and its hood was pulled deep into his face, obscuring all his features. Still, I didn't think too much about it. Just joined him in the booth like I was supposed to and greeted him with the same words I had spoken countless times already. He stayed silent at first. I gave him a bit of time because I thought he just didn't know how to begin. But after several minutes, I asked him what he wanted to confess. A few more seconds passed and then he spoke. He told me he had gone into the woods and he said that in a tone as if I should have known that already. That was all. He did not not elaborate any further, as if that would already count as a sin. I thought him to be a hunter then, asking for forgiveness for the lives of the animals he had killed. Maybe it had been his first hunt and the weight of the innocent lives was heavy upon him. I asked him to continue. He told me about a small clearing where the grass is greener than in the rest of the forest, and about the small cabin that stood on said clearing. Then he fell silent again. I asked why he considered this a sin. That made him laugh for a second and the sound made my skin crawl. It was an ugly, manic laugh. He didn't explain his reasoning, just stood up and left. I was taken aback by all this. Sure, but I just assumed that it had been some weird joke. Either way, I was certain I'd never see the strange man again. I was wrong, of course. He came to the church the next day and walked straight to the confession booth once again, expecting me to follow him. Of course I did. That was my job, and also I hoped he would clear a few things up. I had thought a lot about his earlier confession. He only said he barely slept lately. I answered that I, too, struggled with insomnia and asked once again why he considered this a sin. He laughed again. I wanted to tear my skin off. There was another person who visited the church frequently, outside of the services on Sunday. A young woman who always sat in one of the front rows and silently prayed for a while. We talked a bit sometimes, and she was very polite. I liked her. When she came by the next time, she told me how she felt watched in her own home, and she didn't feel safe there anymore. She prayed for that terrible feeling to go away, and I took the time to pray for her safety. The strange man came by every single day, and he always spoke one or two sentences at most. None of them were a sin. After just three days, he started repeating himself, talking about the woods and about his insomnia again. Always the same things, like a broken record. Even the wording was the same. The first change came the day after my conversation with the young woman, as he stayed silent at first. I asked him if he knew her, just because I had a bad feeling about him. He laughed. I bit down on my lip until I bled. He didn't say a word that day. The man was bad news and I knew it. His visits were going on for over a week at this point, and I had yet to see his face. He always wore that hood and he went straight to the booth each time. Sometimes I only saw him in the corner of my eye. There was no pattern in his arrival. I tried coming in sooner or later, but it made no difference. He came by a few minutes after I got there. He seemed to know when he had to arrive to meet me. After his strange reaction to my question, I was even more worried about the young woman. Knowing that a freak like him was out there made my insomnia even worse. I lay awake in my bed thinking about her. 
When I couldn't take it any longer, I drove over to her house because I felt like the least I could do was bless her apartment. I hoped it would make her feel better. She was reluctant to let me in at first. The poor thing, completely paranoid about something she didn't even know if it was real. She had never seen someone, she had told me earlier, but there had been the most intense feeling of being watched. I explained my intentions and then she finally stepped aside and let me into the flat. She appreciated what I was going to do, she told me. She would indeed feel safer if someone blessed the house. Then at least she could be sure God watched over her. I intended to begin where the feeling was worst, her bedroom. It had a single window that faced towards the backyard as I stood alone in that room and looked outside. I saw him standing there. He faced me, though his face was hidden under the hood of his gray sweater, and he stood perfectly still. We stayed like that for several seconds. He began to laugh. The window was closed, but the sound was so loud as if he stood right beside me. I scratched my skin violently. The young woman burst into the room and yelled at me to leave. I tried to ask her if she knew the man, but she didn't let me speak a single word. Just screamed at me that I should get out of her flat and never come back again. She cried and basically shoved me outside. I told her to call the police. She almost slammed the door into my face. She did call the police. They apparently found the suspect and questioned him, but he seemed perfectly sane and not at all likely to stalk someone and they dropped the case again. There was no evidence after all. The man came to church as always, but after the police had gotten involved, the monotony of his confessions was changed. I remember his words clearly. Don't try to lock me away, father, he hissed and his voice was cold and cruel and oh so angry. I've been locked away for far too long. The young woman didn't come to church anymore. The monotonous confessions of the man continued every single day like a clockwork. The woods and his insomnia always told with the same words. I tried to catch him a few times to exit the booth at the same time as him, just to see his face at least. He was always gone by the time I exited. After just a few days, I decided to visit the clearing the man always mentioned. The grass was indeed greener around the small cabin, and as I walked up to the building, I had the most intense feeling of deja vu. The stench of decay hung in the air. I was just about to touch the doorknob as intense vertigo hit me. I must have blacked out at this point, because the next thing I knew, I was sitting in the confession booth with the strange men on the other side. He asked me when I had last slept. I had no answer and he laughed and I dragged my fingernails across my face until I bled. The insomnia took its toll. I blacked out for short periods of time. A day later I found myself kneeling in front of the altar, the gilded chalice with red wine in my hands and couldn't remember how I got there. But I remembered that I had intended to pray for the young woman and I did just that. Then rose the chalice to my lips and drank. The wine tasted off. I was hyper aware of the metallic taste that must have belonged to the chalice and wondered if it was growing rust. My prayers had no use though. I heard from another church member that the young woman had gone missing. I knew that she was dead and I knew where she was buried, but I had not a single piece of evidence and I didn't want to raise suspicion about myself, so I never called the police. God would judge the strange man, I told myself. He could not escape his punishment. The day after I heard about the woman's disappearance, the strange man was already waiting in the booth for me when I arrived. There was no visible clue that he was in there, but I was sure about it. And although I could have just turned around and went back home, what I probably should have done, I resigned to my fate and entered the booth. He spoke without hesitation this time and these words are burnt into my mind by now. Do you want to confess your sins, father? He asked and he sounded smug and somehow satisfied. I stayed silent, not knowing what he expected me to say. I wasn't aware of any sins I had committed lately, none that would interest him at least. Instead, I wanted to ask him why our roles were suddenly subverted, but he started to laugh and I tried to claw <laughs> my face off again. A few days later, I met another woman at church. I had seen her at almost every service. We had never talked before, but she always smiled politely. She stayed behind after the latest service and asked if I was alright. 
Apparently, she was worried because of the deep, bloody scratches on my face, but I couldn't tell her the truth, so I said nothing at all. She was really nice, said I didn't have to tell her, but that she was always there to talk if I wanted to. I have yet to accept the offer. The situation with the strange man didn't change. He was waiting for me every day when I entered the church, and each time he asked the same question. Do you want to confess your sins, father? I never answered. He always laughed and I scratched my face open until one of us got tired of it and left. It's been like that for six weeks now. I don't know what to do anymore. I can't remember the last time I slept. The strange man's laughter echoes through my head at any given moment. My skin is a torn mess to the point where I have trouble to get the blood out of my clothes. One of my favorite sweaters is ruined already. I know I should just not walk into the confession booth. I should stop talking to him, but I can't. I tried and I always end up in that booth, tearing my skin open while he laughed. Maybe I should just confess my sins. If I only knew what he wants to hear. I will stop writing here. Maybe someone can tell me how to get rid of him. Until then, I have more important matters to take care of. The next service is soon and we're all out of wine. I need to go get some more. This story is told from the perspective of a man. This incident happened just a few hours earlier, and I'm typing this story currently at my workplace. I work in the garden area of a home improvement store. I don't work the cash registers, and my manager doesn't even let me water the flowers, so a lot of the time I have nothing to do. This results in me taking extremely long bathroom breaks, where I just scroll on my phone. I know it sounds bad, but it's better than standing around trying to look busy. Today was the same as any other, with me wasting time in the bathroom. Nothing of interest happened until my work phone buzzed at the same time as the stool next to mine. This becomes important later. A few seconds later, I see that the guy in the next stall had his hand stretched to the ground with his palm facing up. I at first thought he had run out of toilet paper and was asking for mine. He just stayed silent for a while, so I ignored him after that. Then he started moving that hand uncomfortably close to my leg, so I immediately scooted away and prepared to leave. Once the man noticed that, he hurriedly got out his stool before I could leave. Another few seconds of silence. I took a peek out from the gap of the stool door to see what the hell he was doing. And just like a scene from a horror movie, our eyes connected. He was barely an inch away from my door, trying to peek inside. My blood ran cold. If you are wondering why I didn't immediately open the door and cuss the guy out, I really hate confrontation. I avoid it whenever possible, and I do my best not to draw attention to myself. I stood sideways by the door, so he wouldn't be able to see me. That's when the whispering started. I don't know what the first thing he said was, but it sounded like moaning. The next part was a bit more audible. He said something along the lines of wanting to see more of my unflushed toilet paper. I was thoroughly disgusted. This guy was a complete creep and I was alone in the bathroom with him. My heart was beating faster by the second. I know I had to stay there until another person came into the bathroom. No way was I going to confront him alone. Probably a minute later, someone finally arrives and I take this as my chance to wash my hands and get the hell out of there. Thankfully, the presence of the other person made the old man quit his creepy behavior. As I was about to leave, he blocked my path for a quick second before stepping aside. The weird thing was, I don't even think he works at the store because he wasn't wearing any vest. My store is extremely lenient about uniform, but most workers at least wear a vest or something connected to the store. He just looked like a regular customer. I'm certain I heard two phone dings echo in that bathroom. The phones have a signature ring to them, so it couldn't have been a coincidence. Either way, he only started creeping on me once the phone ring made it clear <laughs> that I was an employee. The situation really creeped me out, and I've been totally unfocused on my work since then. I kept prowling the garden area to look out for any old man wearing a similar outfit to the creeper. I have an incredibly hard time 
distinguishing faces, so I probably wouldn't even recognize him, even if I did see him. Creepy bathroom peeper, let's not meet again. When I was 18, I worked at my college's residence building at the front desk, and I think I almost got assaulted, or murdered. You be the judge. During the summer, the building operated as a hotel, so two and a half floors were hotel rooms, and half of the third floor were student rooms. The whole building operated with a hotel swipe key system that was pretty outdated, and all the doors were powered by four AA batteries. If the batteries died, there was a decently lengthy process to replace them and reprogram the door. A dark-haired guy came to the front desk from inside the building while I was working an overnight shift at around 1 or 2 a.m. and said he left his key card in his room. I made him a new one and made my first error of the night. Hotel guests could have as many room keys remade as they wanted, hypothetically. Students, however, were supposed to be given a temporary key card and charge $2 to be returned when theirs is located. I gave him a new key for his room and asked if he was a student or a hotel guest, and he replied, student. At this point, I should have checked our system to charge his account, but I was caught up doing administrative duties and forgot. I used to trust people way too easily at this job, but quickly learned not. Later on in the night, maybe around 3 or 4 a.m., he came to the desk again and said he couldn't get into his room. I asked if he just forgot his key again, and he said no, the door wasn't working. I asked if the light was coming on when he swiped his card, and he said no, so I figured the batteries were dead. I told him I'd have to change the batteries, and I went up to his room with him. He asked me for my name, and I told him. He didn't tell me his. I opened the room door manually with a master key, and told him I'd have to prop it open while I worked on the back panel to replace the batteries. He said, no, it's okay, I'll close it, and closed and deadbolted the door locked. Really fucking weird, but I tried not to think about it. I had changed the batteries on plenty of other doors by this point, and some students were iffy about having their doors propped open for their room to be on display for anyone walking by. He also had a really thick accent, and I thought he might be an international student, since we had a lot of students from other countries where English was not their first language. I gave him the benefit of the doubt and thought maybe it was also just a language barrier issue. At this point though, I really felt like something was wrong, but I tried to ignore it so I didn't freak him out. While I was trying to focus on fixing the door as quickly as possible, he kept trying to entice me to go further into the room, saying his bed was broken and he needed me to take a look at it. There was something underneath that needed to be fixed, etc. He held out a little gold house key and said, I have a key, go get it, and threw it under the bed. He said there was a leak under the fridge. He just kept trying to get me down on the ground, throwing random problems at me. Obviously, I told him no. I'd send maintenance up in the morning to take a look at it if anything was broken. I had my back to him, and he asked me if I would take off my glasses. I said, no, I need them to see. His tone of voice changed. And in the most steady, chilling manner, he said, Ella, it's okay. You can take them off. And from behind me, he reached around and tried to take off my glasses. I swatted his hand away and trying to remain composure said, No thanks. I need to keep them on. Even though he was creeping me the fuck out, I didn't want to be rude to him. I didn't want to get in trouble if he complained about me or risk upsetting him and having him yell at me. I got up to grab something from the door repair kit and undid the door deadbolt and opened it up in the process. He jumped towards the door to close it again and told me to keep it closed. I told him no. I had to open it to start reprogramming it from the front. While I held the door open with my foot and grabbed something from the door repair kit, he started playing with the little wispy hairs at the top of my forehead and trying to touch my shoulder. I swatted him away again and asked him not to touch me and focused on getting the fuck out of there. He once again tried getting me to follow him into the bedroom, saying the bed was broken, and I went as far as the door frame to see if I could spot any actual problem with his bed. This is when I realized he had nothing in his room. No dishes in the kitchen, no shower curtain in the bathroom, no sheets on the bed, nothing. This wasn't his room. 
My brain once again went back to the international student theory, thinking he had just arrived today and hadn't gotten a chance to buy anything yet, but in the pit of my stomach, I knew something was wrong. I fiddled around with the door for a few more seconds before announcing that it was fixed, and quickly gathered the door kit and left. Before I had reached the elevator, he came back out without his shoes on to follow me. He tried to get back in to get his shoes and called out, Ella, the door isn't fixed. You need to come back. I went back and opened the door manually and told him if the door was broken, I'd have to send up maintenance to fix it in the morning. I knew he was going to follow me to the elevator again, so I closed the door behind me once he went inside and ran down the stairwell as fast as I could. When I got to the front desk, I checked the computer and saw that the room he was in was supposed to be empty. It wasn't a student room or a hotel room. I locked myself in our back office and called campus security. He came down a few minutes later and went behind the desk. I yelled at him to get on the other side and wait. Now that I knew he wasn't a resident, he tore the corner off a slip of paper I had sitting on the desk and drew a flower on it, then put it back on top of my papers. When security arrived, he ran back up to the empty room and tried convincing them he lived there so he wouldn't have to leave. He kept showing them his key, which had decided to work on the door again somehow. They escorted him back downstairs and came to ask me if he really did live there. Obviously he fucking didn't, that's why I called you guys crying and terrified. He kept interjecting to argue that he did live there, but couldn't even recall his room number when asked. Security asked him for his student card and he couldn't produce it, so they told him he would have to leave if he couldn't prove he lived there. While they were grabbing his information, I listened from the office and could immediately tell he was lying. The phone number he gave was just a bunch of random numbers. The name he gave was prefixed by, um, as if he was trying to think of a name. When they asked him for his address, he just said, across the street. One security guard asked if he lived in the apartments across the street, and he said yes, but couldn't tell them what the building number was. He said his apartment number was 1200, but I moved into that building a few months later, and apartment 1200 doesn't exist. When security asked what his purpose was to be sneaking into a room, he just kept up the ums and ahs and saying he didn't know. They'd ask, were you trying to see a friend? Do you know anybody who lives here? Were you here to hurt somebody? And he kept fidgeting and saying, I don't know, no reason, I was just here. At one point, he tried to tell him he was my friend, at which point I poked my head out of the office to say that I literally had never seen him before that night. He left. We didn't call the police because he didn't actually do anything, but it was still fucking unsettling. Later on, it dawned on me how he figured out that the room was vacant. One of the housekeepers had been using it as her personal break room. A few days later, a housekeeper came to the desk and told me they found the door deadbolted open, the TV on and a housekeeper inside watching TV. She must have forgotten to close the door when she left for the night, and when the creep let himself into the building, he found it. I never saw him again, and to this day, I have no clue what he was doing there. I haven't worked there since last winter, and overnight shifts still have me the heebie-jeebies. I've had a few scary encounters in my life. Not sure if that means that I'm old or just a creep magnet, but this one still creeps me out. In the early 80s, when I was eight, my family was visiting my uncle who lived in Backwoods, Missouri. He lived on a lot of land, and the only other people who really even lived on the street were relatives, so no one else just ever happened to be out there. This meant no one ever locked their doors because random family members were always coming by for this or that. One night while we were there, my parents and aunt and uncle decided to go to a nearby town to go bowling because bowling. My brothers, who were 11 and 12, my female cousins, 6 and 14, and I, I'm female, stayed home. It was still daylight when the adults left, but it started raining pretty hard and got dark quickly. We used to play this game that was essentially hide-and-seek in the dark house, but we cleverly called it Vampire. There was a thin, little mattress on the living room floor that some of the kids would sleep on at night, so the person who was it 
would lie on the mattress and fold it over themselves like a coffin and count down to midnight. When they got to midnight, they went looking for you. Again, all of the lights are off, and you tried to make it back to the coffin before you got caught. Because the house was in the country, it was pitch black at night. You couldn't see your hand in front of your face. What this meant for the game was that, one, you couldn't tell where the vampire was looking, so you just had to make a break for it, and two, if you were extremely lazy, and I'm sure by now you can guess which one of us met those standards, you could hide in the living room with a coffin and get to base quickly. Ben, my 11-year-old brother was it and was doing the normal countdown. I was hiding maybe six feet from him. As he's counting, there's a flash of lightning. I don't know if I was already looking at the living room window or if the lightning made me look, but with the backlight of the lightning, I see a man with his face against the window. He had his hands on each side of his face as if he's trying to peer in and looks exactly like the stereotypical creepster, heavy set, scraggly beard, etc. I could feel every hair on my body standing on end. Immediately, I began trying to convince myself that I didn't see what I saw, but then Ben sternly whispered, if anyone is hiding in here, stay still. I sort of croaked out and I'm here, right as there was another flash of lightning. Creepster was still there, but no longer trying to look in the window. Instead, he was now looking toward the front door. Ben and I immediately knew what was coming next. From where he was standing, Creepster was probably only five feet from the front door. Ben was the same distance, but there was a couch between him and the door. Ben leapt over the couch and locked the door right as Creepster started trying the handle. At this point, I guess Ben decided that it was best to let Creepster know that people were home and that we knew he was there because he flipped on the porch light and then started turning on the lights in the house. This is going to sound weird, but I was too terrified to panic. Having said that, I was relying completely on Ben to know and tell me what to do. He told me to go lock the other doors and was yelling for everyone else to come out and to lock all of the windows. Honestly, the next few minutes are hazy in my mind. I remember everything up until this point extremely clearly. Then I remember the end very clearly, but I'm less clear about the middle. I know that I locked the side door and then the sliding glass door on the back of the house. When we've talked about it over the years, some people remember us seeing him out the back door as well. I don't think I remember that. What I clearly recall is locking the sliding glass door and standing there frozen and hearing Ben in a very calm but firm voice say, close the curtain, listen to me, okay? Close the curtain. So I did. Ben can't remember that part and I just remember my fear and Ben's voice, so I'm not sure if I saw Creepster in the backyard or not. We tried to call the police, but my aunt and uncle had a stupid party line and it wouldn't work, whether from the storm or from a neighbor leaving it off the hook or whatever. For the record, they are the only people I've ever known with a party line, so this wasn't normal to me either. But for those of you who don't know what that is, in really rural areas, multiple people on the street would actually share a phone line. It would have different rings for different households, but you could pick up the phone and listen to your neighbor's conversation. We also tried to summon help on my uncle's CB radio, but couldn't reach anyone. My uncle was a hunter, so he had a gun rack full of rifles in his room, but my older cousin was on an out-of-town hunting trip and took them with him. All we could find was a BB gun that looked like a real rifle. I vividly remember Ben putting me on phone duty and Scott, my older brother, on CB duty while he stood watch at the little square window on the front door with the BB gun. Maybe 30 minutes later, Ben said, He's back. He's coming up the driveway. The rest of us froze in fear, but Ben opened the front door and stepped out on the porch, pointed the gun and said, Get out of here right now. 
Then we hear our cousin Kyle, who lived down the road a bit, say, You know that's a BB gun, right? Even though Kyle was only 15, I remember that we felt like we had been saved when he showed up. Kyle seemed really skeptical of our story, like we were playing a trick on him, even though we had no idea that he was coming. But he stayed with us until our parents came home. Honestly, I don't remember if we even told our parents what happened when they got home. There was definitely no police involvement though. We just went on with our trip but we never played vampire again without some mention of that night. Edit. I just talked to Ben. First, he doesn't have an account, but is so pleased that everyone thinks he handled himself well. Second, he said the story was pretty spot on to how he remembers it, but that the guy at the back door, when we talked about it before, I thought he didn't remember that part, so I was confused on that. He said that as I was locking the side door, we saw a Creepster moving around to the back of the house, so Ben told me to hurry and lock the sliding glass door. Those doors are right around the corner from each other, so I was closest. According to Ben, and this is what I thought happened, but I didn't want to say it unless I was positive. As soon as I flipped the lock on the back door, the guy was standing there, just looking in at me. I stood there for a couple of beats looking at him, and that's when Ben told me to close the curtain. We also saw him in the front yard one more time after that. I remembered this all along, but wanted to check with Ben to make sure he also remembered it before I added it in. It was a large front yard with a long gravel driveway. Off to one side of the driveway, quite a ways from the house, was a spot where my cousins parked cars they were working on. I know, so stereotypical. While we were on watch, we saw Creepster messing with one of the cars. It was actually Kyle's. When he couldn't get it started, he walked into the woods that ran beside the house. We didn't see him again after that. I'm currently 21 and female. And this happened to me about six years ago, when I was 15 years old. I live in a relatively small town where everyone knows everyone. For reference, there were about 120 kids in my graduating class in high school. The town is so small and there's not a lot of ground to cover. So it wasn't unusual for parents to let their teenagers wander around outside with their friends. My friend from a different town had come over to my house because we were going to see my school's musical later that night. We decided to go wander around outside until it was time to go. She was from a different town, so she was unfamiliar with the area. I suggested we go down to my local train tracks because there's this cool cliff or overpass type thing where you can sit and watch the river. I had been to the train tracks with my friends many times before and People my age used to hang out there all the time. This was sometime in early March, so it was still quite cold where I lived. Even though it was chilly, I remember distinctly that I wore flip-flops for some reason. This will be important later. The train tracks intersected a street in my town, which was quite close to my house. So this is where we entered the tracks. We were walking and spotted a middle-aged man who was alone, and on the phone. We thought nothing of it and kept walking. We made it to the overpass and were sitting there, just hanging out, when we noticed the man we had passed earlier was slowly inching closer and closer. We both noticed this but decided not to panic since it's possible he was just slowly making his way down the tracks. Maybe five minutes had passed and the man was getting increasingly closer and closer to us. At this point, we notice that he's getting closer to us at an alarming rate. He's not continuously in motion. It's more like we notice him standing still doing whatever. And then a minute later, he's standing still even closer to us than he was prior. Now, he's close enough that we can clearly make him out. He's within earshot and could easily get to us if that was his goal. My friend and I are starting to get nervous. We're two teenage girls in the middle of essentially the woods and no one around us other than this creepy man. I've watched a lot of investigation discovery in my day, so I think it's best to just try to promptly make my way out of there without creating chaos. I decide it would be a good idea to pull out my phone and pretend to talk to my mother as we begin walking back to the main road. 
my friend and I are calmly walking down the tracks while I have the phone up to my ear. I'm saying things like, yeah, we're at the tracks, we're on our way home. Just making shit up so this guy thinks my mom is aware of my exact location. There is a point where we have to walk directly past the man in order to make it to our destination. It's at this point where he opens his mouth and says clear as day, I know you're not on the phone. At this point, my fight or flight kicks in, and I'm terrified. Up until this moment, the creepy man had not directly said or done anything to make us think he was a direct threat. The situation was uncomfortable enough that my friend and I thought we better head out. When the man said those words to me, I quickly realized that the perceived threat was both real and dangerous. As soon as my brain registered what he said, my friend and I both ran for our lives. I was never one to enjoy physical activity, let alone running, but I could have won an Olympic medal that day. I ran so fast that my flip-flop broke and ended up running barefoot on the gravel that lined the tracks. I was so scared that if I looked back, I would see him running after me, so I didn't. When I finally began running out of steam, I quickly looked back and saw the man standing right where we had left him. He didn't run after us, but I couldn't shake the fear of turning around and seeing him chasing me. When we finally made it to the main road, I quickly called my mom and told her what happened. She was conveniently driving down the exact road we were on and pulled up about two minutes later and took us home. My friend and I have never been so scared in our lives. I haven't been on those tracks since, and to this day, I still think about the man who knew I wasn't on the phone and what his intentions were that day. I married my wife, Anne, about three months ago. The other night, we were sitting at our table, having some wine after dinner. We were just doing our usual joking around and being playful before we started getting into some deep talks. She asked me, what was the worst job you've ever had? Just the most annoying place you've ever worked for. And normally I just give some bullshit answer about how I used to work in a job in retail or the food industry. But I was in a bit of a talkative mood, so I gave the real answer. When I was 16, I used to babysit this 8-year-old girl that lived on my street, Samantha. Her parents knew my parents, and so it was a pretty chill gig. Sam's parents would go out to dinner or a movie or something and I'd just feed her some mac and cheese, then tuck her in. I made like 50 bucks a night, which was a lot of cash as a teenager. I did the job several times a week for about six months, but there was a good stretch of time during the final month I babysat where things started to get weird. At first I thought it was just Sam's imagination running wild, as children's minds do, but I quickly realized she was never lying. She was always 100% honest. It started with something simple, I got her ready for bed and she came downstairs saying that there was something in her closet. So I took her back up the stairs and showed her nothing was there, but she kept insisting something was there. After a couple of nights of her saying something was in her closet, whatever this thing was started moving around. She started saying it was under her bed, then in the hallway, until he finally settled on being on her ceiling. And that's where he stayed. She always complained something was on her ceiling, and I'd have to read her a little bedtime story to help her go to bed. But then even weirder things started happening. She would say stuff moved on its own, and her door would open and close by itself. But the thing always stayed on the ceiling. So finally my curiosity got the best of me, and I asked her, Sam, what does this thing look like? And when I asked, I saw her take the question really seriously. I should have known then that she wasn't lying. He's tall, with no hair, and, and, she was really struggling with this final detail. It's okay, Sam. You can tell me. She swallowed before saying, he has no eyes. Even then it scared me. And even though I had a perfect description of him, it couldn't prepare me for when I finally saw him. This entity started making it so Sam couldn't fall asleep. So she would become sleep deprived and start hallucinating. She would start screaming randomly, and she'd have to hide in my arms until her parents got home. I tried warning her parents, but they just kept chalking it up to kids being kids. It got worse and worse with each passing night. Then one night, I was with Sam trying to calm her down while she cried. But then, I started to doze off, and so did she. 
After I was asleep for a while, I opened my eyes, but I couldn't move. I tried yelling for help, but my mouth wouldn't move either. Then I noticed him. Out of the right corner of my eye, I saw a tall, gangly man. He had no hair on his body, and just like Sam had said, he had no eyes. Not even holes or concaves where his eyes would be. Just a flat surface from his forehead to his nose. His skin was pale, but there were these markings all over him. Some markings were black, others were red and looked as if they were bleeding. I tried screaming, but it was pointless. He approached me and stroked my cheek with his finger. Even without his eyes, I could tell he was studying me. He ran his fingers through my hair, rubbed my earlobes, and grabbed my face, yanking it left and right to get a better look at me. He leaned in closer to me, and I heard him sniff. He started licking his lips as he continued sniffing near my neck. He opened his mouth and let out one big sigh. I started shivering. The room became ice cold. I tried moving my arms to warm myself up, but I still sat there unable to move. Tears began to roll down my face. I couldn't respond. I couldn't fight him. But worst of all, I couldn't help Sam. The man reached down and grabbed her face with his hand, and right before my eyes, I saw the color leave her body. Tears were now flowing. He held her mouth shut and looked up at me. I saw one of the red markings on his hand stop bleeding and turn black like the others. Then before I knew it, he was gone, and I was left holding Sam's corpse. The cops came and her parents were in agony for several years. Her father never stopped blaming me for it. I tried telling the cops what I saw, but they didn't believe me. The autopsy report just showed that her heart had failed. A kid gone too soon to natural causes, they called it. I'll never forget how scared she was, how I wish I could have done more to help her. My wife was in tears the whole story. I'm so sorry, Elliot. You did what you could. She stroked my cheek. So yeah, that's the worst job I've ever had. Just would be curious to hear some of your guys' worst job experiences. I'll be up late reading comments. I've been having trouble sleeping. And as I sit here finishing this post, I swear I keep hearing something in my closet. My name is John J. Gorderi. I'm 26 years old, and I work at a previously local coffee shop. I say previously local because I don't think I'm anywhere close to that place. Let me start from the beginning. I was working as a cashier that day and taking orders when I saw a person across the street. I didn't think anything of it till hours later when we had little activity and I saw that they were still there. Out of curiosity, I asked the other cashier if he saw the person as well. As they turned up to look at them, they looked confused. Weren't they standing there like three hours ago? He asked. I replied with a shrug and told him that I was going to check on them. As I headed out the door, I turned around to see most of my co-workers gathering behind the counter. I turned back and took a long look at them. They were wearing a black trench coat, a pair of dirty sneakers, and a baseball cap that looked like it had sat on his head his entire life. Hey guy, are you all good? You've been standing there for hours now, I called out to him from across the street. He didn't move or show any signs of hearing me. Hesitantly, I walked across the street, and at this moment I know why my parents told me to look both ways before crossing the street, because at that moment I was struck by a semi going well over the speed limit. I don't remember much of that, but what I do remember is that I didn't feel a thing, and the strange man lifted his head slightly, and I saw a ghostly <laughs> white face and the smile of a man who has no sympathy left. I remember hearing the sounds of my co-workers gathering around me. One of them was calling the police, and for a short while I could open my eyes. I saw the blood starting to pool around me and people standing over me, but the thing I remembered the most clearly was the other cashier was looking around, and I didn't realize this till later, but he was looking for the guy, which implies he either ran or disappeared. I woke up later in a hospital room surrounded by all sorts of equipment and many tubes running from my body. I took a good long look at myself, my right arm and leg were both broken and strung up from the roof. I tried to move my head, but pain shot through my body like electricity. My neck was in a brace, but I could still barely move it, 
but it still hurt to move it, so I just moved my eyes and not my head. I looked forward and saw a few x-rays, but they were pictures of a leg, a neck, and I think the last one was an arm, but it looked like a glass table that had been in an earthquake. As an educated guess, I think they were my x-rays. My leg was broken right at the place where it meets the hip, and my neck wasn't broken, but from what I could tell, something wasn't right. I tried to call out for any nurses or a doctor, but I couldn't produce any sounds. It's a strange feeling when your brain tells you to do something, but you can't. It gives you this feeling of confusion and fear. After this whole ordeal with not being able to yell, I remembered that hospitals have a button to call a nurse. I used my left hand to feel for it, and I didn't find one, but either way I heard the door to the right open. Something about the footsteps didn't sound right. They sounded uneven or out of time. I don't remember. Whoever they were walked over to my bed and started fiddling with the equipment next to me. And for some reason, I didn't alert them I was awake. But as they were leaving, I must have pushed the button off the bed somehow. Because next thing I know, there's a clatter on the wall. And whoever was in my room shambled over to the wall, never looking at me. And picked up the button and set it back on my bed. They started to walk over to the door, but they stopped at the foot of the bed. And for some reason, I closed my eyes like I was sleeping. But opened my left eye just enough to see out of it. The nurse turned to face me, or at least turned her head to me because she had no face. Out of fear for what would happen to me if I did anything, I just sat in the bed and watched as she walked to the door and out into the hall. After a long time, I finally relaxed. Then I started to realize the true scale of my danger and I let out a silent scream. I will spare you the day to day, but after a week or so of the faceless nurses, I became desensitized to it and I just waited for the nurses to leave my room. They removed my neck brace after a month or so and I heard from just outside my door some muttering that didn't even sound like a language, but I could make out one word, miraculous, which was probably referring to my recovery. Not long after they removed my neck brace and did they remove my leg cast. I think after a year in the hospital, I finally worked up the courage to yell out to the nurses, but no one came. Then I tried the button, but again, no luck. After that, I realized they don't come when called, they come when they want to. At that, I moved my right arm with my left, which hurt to high hell, but I had to. I threw my legs over the bed and pushed myself up, but instantly I fell to the ground, which I probably should have expected after sitting in a bed for a year and then some. I pulled myself up with all my might and threw myself back into bed and for the next three months or so I threw myself out of bed trying to build my strength and eventually I did. I taught myself how to walk again. Slowly I would make my way to the door and then walk back. One day I tried the doorknob only to find that it was locked. Each day I tried to open that damn door but nothing would come of it. I eventually was able to run and walk like I was before the truck. I had the great idea one day to use the bed as a ram against the door. I grabbed the foot of the bed and pulled it forward. It slid with ease and as I twisted, I started pushing it at the door with great speed and within seconds I slammed into the head of the bed as it slammed into the door. I pulled it back to the wall again and tried again, but still nothing came of it. I tried for days, but then I had a great thought. What if I push the bed at the door when the nurse opens the door? And that's what I did. I waited. She didn't come for weeks, but when she opened that door, I was ready and I pushed off the wall and slid at the door and slammed into the nurse. And just before I went through the door, I jumped off the bed and started running down the hall. As I ran, I heard a shrill shriek from behind me and I turned to see what happened. Apparently, those things are incredibly fragile because when I looked at it, it was bleeding this purple liquid from where I had hit it with the bed. It collapsed to the ground with a dull thud. I continued to run without stopping and as I ran through the halls, the nurses didn't try to touch me. They just kept moving on with their day. As I ran, the walls and rooms became more and more run down and decrepit. As I ran past these destroyed rooms, I saw those things forming from the walls, and these ones were aggressive, but at least, for this part, they only came from the rooms. When I made it to the first floor, the hospital was practically collapsing. 
checked this floor, the nurses didn't only come from the rooms, they came from everywhere. I started running down the hallway, but as I did, so did the arms and tried to scratch and claw at me. Some of them even got me, but I was running so fast they couldn't get a good grip on me. I ran past the reception desk and through the doors, and when I made it outside, there was nothing. As far as I could tell, the hospital was the only thing that existed there. I didn't care, though, because I just ran and ran and ran without stopping. I made it so far that I could just barely make out the outline of the hospital in the distance. I sat down in the empty field and eventually fell asleep or passed out. It was one of those two. I eventually woke up in the one place I didn't want to, the same hospital I first woke up in. Somehow I knew I wasn't home. I looked around the room trying to get my vision to focus. As I was doing this, I noticed a person sitting in the chair next to my bed. I still couldn't see, but I could make out a baseball hat, a dirty black coat, and a pair of dirty sneakers. I slowly looked up to his face, and I didn't <laughs> need my vision to focus to know who was sitting next to me. We all have those calls that haunt us. There's not a 911 dispatcher alive who doesn't have at least one that sticks with them for the rest of their lives. Hell, most have too many to count. I always thought I was above that. I'd never let this job or those calls get to me. I was tough. But then, September 12th happened. I worked the night shift in a very rural sheriff's office, a little over 1,200 square miles with a population of 31,000. Not a lot in the way of heinous crimes happened. There were those out of the ordinary UFO calls every now and then, but most of the time, it was loose cows and car deer accidents. We sure do have our share of crazies. And that night, my caller was one of them. It was about 3.01 in the morning. My partner Anna and I were watching reruns of 90 Day Fiancé when the 911 call tones went off. Totally routine. I try to answer the phones faster than Anna because she has the quickest hands in the West when it comes to call taking. And unfortunately, this time, I got it. County 911, what's the address of your emergency? Silence. Hello, County 911. More silence. I look to my call screen where the coordinates are. Updating the call, it finally phases to the correct coordinates to map roughly where the caller is. Hello, County 911. What's your emergency? I repeat again, entering the coordinates in. It maps to a residence in our second largest city. And immediately, I knew who our caller is. Marjorie Cannonberry. Don't let her name fool you. She's not a sweet old lady, but rather a 32-year-old drug user. Extensive history in our in-house records. And I don't even need to look her up. In my three years of dispatching here, I can't recall just one week where I didn't have a call with Marjorie. Hello, Marge. Do you have an emergency? I ask again. We're on first name basis. Yes. I finally hear her whisper. Okay. What's going on? There's... She pauses, her breathing trembling slightly. There's something in my closet. There's someone in your closet? I ask, quickly typing into my call narrative. How do you know they're there? Did you see them? No. Not someone. She whispered again. I could tell she was truly terrified. Something. I don't know what it is. Okay. At this point, I'm convinced Marge is having another drug-induced hallucination. It wouldn't be the first time. Describe for me what it looks like. In the background, Anna is dispatching our area deputy. Please send someone? Marge whispered. Yes, I have a deputy on the way, Marge. But I need you to tell me what you're seeing, I said. When you said something, what did you mean? It's tall, she said. It has to bend over to fit, and it has long claws. She paused, and I could hear her sniffing. She was definitely crying. It's tapping them on the floor. Can you hear them? She paused, and I listened carefully to see if I could actually hear anything. Maybe it was my imagination, but I thought, just barely, I could hear a rhythmic tapping. Did you hear them? She asked, almost desperately, like she was begging me to believe her. I ignored her question. What else, Marge? What else do you see? Um, her voice trembled. It's all black and it has really big teeth. It keeps licking its teeth like it wants to eat me. So it knows you're there? Yes, she said shakily. 
It's staring right at me, glowing yellow eyes. For the first time in my life, a shiver went down my spine from her words. Every horror movie I've ever seen came to mind. Though I knew better, my supernatural bone was beat. Could there really be a demon in her closet? Are you able to leave the room, Marge? I asked, typing all of this into our dispatch narrative. Can you go outside until my deputy gets there to see what's in there? I don't think so, she sobbed. If I move, it'll kill me. Have you been drinking tonight, Marjorie? I know how incriminating it sounded, but it was a legitimate clarifying question. Call me heartless if you want. No, she sobbed again. Please believe me. I know I've done stupid things before, but this is real. I haven't been drinking, and I haven't taken any drugs recently. I don't know what it is, but I'm so scared. It keeps tapping its claws. You have to hear them, don't you? The phone cracked as she held it out at arm's length. There was no mistaking this time. I could hear something tapping. A pit formed in my stomach. What the fuck? It was like the sound of long, acrylic fingernails. Okay, Marge, I'm going to stay on the phone with you until my deputy gets there. I look to our mapping software. He's not super far out, so it shouldn't be too much longer. Okay, thank you, she whispered. It's just staring at me. Does it have a face, I asked, against my better judgment. Did I actually believe there was something there? Yeah, but it's all teeth. Like it's smiling. And it hasn't moved since you saw it. No, it's just there, staring and tapping its claws. How long has it been there? I don't know. I woke up to the tapping noise and just saw it there. So I called you right away, Marge said. You don't believe me, do you? It's not that I don't believe you, Marge, I answered. I've just never heard of this sort of thing before. What you're describing sounds like a demon from a horror film. I think it is. Another shiver. Her voice sounded so convinced. Real or not, she was legitimately seeing something. Whether it was an actual demon or a hallucination, part of me felt bad for her. Being absolutely convinced something like what she described was staring at her, it would be terrifying. Marge suddenly gasped as the phone rustled as it fell from her hands. What's going on, Marge? I asked quickly, my tone dropping in seriousness. It's coming towards me! She screamed. Oh god, it's claws! Please help me! My deputy is almost there, Marge, I said loudly over her screams, but I doubt she heard me. If I hadn't been freaked out by then, I was now. Those blood-curdling screams were ones of pure and unfiltered terror. It's like I was listening to someone whose life was coming to an end in the most violent way possible. My pulse was flying as I was trying to type everything I heard into the call. Next to me, Anna was relaying the info to our deputy. Come on, I thought. Get there already. The problem with a rural county was that we didn't have as many deputies on as others, so our response time was significantly longer. This particular night, that city's officer had called in sick so it was the county's job to cover if there were any calls. 1303, be advised. She's screaming and not answering us anymore. Tasha said to our responding deputy. 1303, 10-4, two minutes out. 1308 to dispatch, I'll be 1076 as well. Our other unit in the area piped up. I had seen him making his way towards the area before, but now he was going emergent. I repeatedly tried to get Marge to come back on the phone, but all I could hear were her screams. I could also hear things being thrown around, like she was smashing into them with her body. And suddenly, as quick as it happened, everything went silent. Marge! I shouted. Marge, are you there? The phone crackled. He's going to kill me, Marge said monotonously. He knows who you are now. You're next. And then the line went dead. If I had a handset phone, it would have fallen out of my hand. How would anyone not get unnerved by something like that? The movie lover in me was terrified. You're next. 1303, dispatch. I'm 1023. The first responding deputy advised he was on scene. His name was Jason, our youngest deputy in the department. A super nice kid who was probably the best person that could respond to help Marge. Anna held radio traffic just for that call. And we waited for what seemed like an eternity as Jason went into the house. 1303, dispatch. It nearly made me jump out of my seat, my nerves on end. Get a med rolling. She's cut up her arms pretty bad. Within five minutes, our med unit was rolling. Jason and Trevor, his backup, ended up chaptering Marge. 
They came up before Jason transferred her to the mental hospital. After getting medical clearance and explained everything that happened, apparently Marge was tripping on drugs. My first suspicion and decided to cut her arms with razor blades. She also trashed her apartment in her drug stupor, which would explain the crashing around I heard. But what about the tapping? I asked. I heard the tapping she was talking about. I don't know anything about that, Jason said with a shrug. But it was probably something she was doing that she didn't realize she was doing. Yeah, you're probably right, I said, but I still couldn't shake the bad feeling. It's sad, honestly, Jason said, retrieving the papers off of the printer that he was printing. She's so fried from drugs, she's just crazy now. I glanced out the dispatch window to the lobby, where Trevor was sitting with Marge. She sat with her head hanging down and her arms in bandages. Seeing someone hopped up on drugs was always a little disturbing to me. As if she knew I was looking at her, she lifted her head and her eyes met mine. They grew wide as if she was about to be hit by a bus. And then she pointed at me, letting out another piercing cry. Trevor stood up as she did, putting himself between her and me inadvertently. I couldn't shake the feeling that she was pointing at me, but rather behind me. I told myself it was dumb, but why was it I couldn't look over my shoulder? Jason flew out the door with the paperwork he needed and both struggled down the front with her to load her up in the squad. In two days, hospital staff would find Marge dead in her room. Her head somehow twisted unnaturally around. Her death would never have a full explanation. Finally, after taking a deep breath, I turned around. There was nothing there. I let out a breath that I didn't know was holding and then laughed at myself. Of course there was nothing there. The rest of the shift went by smoothly. The whole 20 minutes we had left. When we finally left that night, I couldn't wait to go home and go to bed. That call had really rattled me and left me with a headache. I got back to my apartment, greeted by my little white cat. After giving her more food, I took off my uniform and hung it up in the closet making sure to close the doors. Hurrying back to my bed, I jumped in and turned the TV on for background noise. That night, I slept with the lights on. Maybe it was just my imagination running wild or the stress of a long week. But as I closed the door to my closet, I could have sworn there was a pair of glowing yellow eyes staring back at me. This happened in May 2007, and for reference, I'm female, was 20 at the time, and weighed about 115 pounds, so overpowering me would have been extremely easy. I live in a city in Northern Ireland, and at the time, I was best friends with my ex-boyfriend. My ex-boyfriend's cousin's band decided to play a small gig way out in the countryside, so we had to drive for about an hour or more to get to the location. We arrived, and it was literally a field amongst fields, smack back in the back arse of nowhere. Apparently, one of the members of the band knew the owner of this field, and apparently we had permission to be there. I never checked, so I don't know, but whatever. There were several cars already there when we arrived. Me, my ex, his sister, and two friends travelled together. We had packed the car full of tents, sleeping bags, and a ton of alcohol. The plan was to watch the band, then blast some tunes, have a bit of a party, and spend the night in the field in our tents. The way the field was laid out was kind of in an L shape. All the tents were set up around the corner, and the band had set up a generator across the field on the other side. Then beside where the tents were, there was a hole in a bush to the other field. We went through here to go to the toilet, so we had some privacy from everyone. There was roughly 30 to 40 people in the field, and the band started playing. We started drinking, and generally having a great time. Any time I needed to pee, I went with my ex's sister, or a friend, as it was a good few minutes walk to the next field, and none of us wanted to go alone, even though we were in the middle of nowhere. I was sharing a tent with my ex for the night, and at about 3am, I decided I'd had enough and wanted to go back to the tent to sleep. I told him I was going and made my journey across the field to the tents. As I got into the tent and pulled the zipper down, I felt someone tugging at it and assumed it was my ex, until I heard an unfamiliar voice say, let me in, quite aggressively. 
I called out, who are you? And he said, I know you're alone in there. You can't hold the zipper down forever. Let me in. Over the next minute or so, I was gripping onto the zipper of the tent and holding both sides of the fabric together to prevent this guy from getting into my tent. A couple of times, he managed to get the zipper up a bit, but I always managed to get it back down. For the life of me, I have no idea how I managed to do this. The whole time we were struggling against each other over the zipper, he kept saying things like, I'm going to get in eventually, bitch, and it's going to be worse if you don't fucking let me in. I was absolutely petrified. Then I heard my ex-boyfriend's booming voice shout, What the fuck are you doing at that tent? Then I heard a smack and a thud, and my ex called to ask me if I was okay. My ex had saw what was happening, punched the guy, and he fell. He had watched me walk to the tents and watched this dude follow behind, assuming he was going to the loo, but he kept watching him to make sure. When he saw him turn towards the tents, he came over to make sure I was okay. Thank God he did. Anyway, a huge fight broke out, and then one of the creepy guy's friends ended up hitting him too. <laughs> Turns out he was known for this kind of creepy behavior and had been in trouble with the law for sexually harassing women in the past. And my ex's cousin had said that he was staying over at her house with her brother one night, and she woke up to find him standing in her room, watching her sleep. I really don't know what his intentions were had he managed to fight his way into the tent that night. No one would have heard anything as the music was so loud, but thank goodness my ex still cared enough about me to keep an eye on me as I made my way back to the tent that night. My ex actually bumped into the guy a few weeks later and told me that his lip was still pretty busted up and looked like he was going to have a permanent scar from the two punches. <laughs> so this happened a few months ago. I'm a sophomore in college and was traveling down to my hometown over break. I was having some relationship issues with my stepmom, so I didn't want to stay at my dad's house that night I arrived at my hometown so I phoned a friend of mine from high school if I could stay at his place. I knew from social media that he was still in town, and I've stayed at his place before, so I knew there would be a place for me to stay if they could allow it. My friend, let's call him Z, seemed like a pretty normal dude. We weren't best friends or anything, but we got pretty close by the time we graduated. We would occasionally text or hang out if I was in town and catch up, reminisce on the times we spent in orchestra or in English class. When I called, he seemed extremely enthusiastic. Z's a normally upbeat guy, but this time it seemed like he was getting a brand new car. I didn't think about it at the time, and he said I could sleep in the guest room, so I headed over. When I got to his house, he was just as excited as he was on the phone. He was bringing up stuff to do like getting high and watching weird movies or playing video games. Z's parents weren't home, so he really wanted the opportunity to smoke. I was pretty tired from the drive, but since we rarely see each other, I thought a little bit of bonding couldn't hurt. We played Smash Brothers, smoked some weed, and just chat for a few hours. It was longer than I wanted, but I was having fun, so whatever, right? By the time it was getting late, around 2 a.m., he started asking some pretty weird questions like if I ever wondered what it was like to kill someone or if I thought anyone would miss me if I was gone. This along with some pretty normal questions like if I had a boyfriend or how my parents are doing or if I'm making any friends at school gave me a weird feeling. I was confused in the moment, but it didn't hit me until after that Z could be assessing me for something bad. The weirdness of it all made me just want to go to bed. We stopped the game and both went into the basement where his room and the guest room were. We say goodnight. I go to my room and get ready for bed. I'm having trouble sleeping, just insomnia that I've had for a while. So I stay awake for around an hour until I hear some movement outside my room. The walls were pretty thin, so I could hear footsteps walking past my door and up the stairs to the main floor, then back down quickly after. What struck me as odd was that I didn't hear the basement door open, which creaks when it does. The light didn't turn on, so I was confused what Z was doing. 
I heard him go back into his room, but I had this odd feeling. Just, ever since I met him this night, he seemed a lot different than he's ever been. I decide to look him up on social media and Google to see anything out of the ordinary. Everything seemed normal until I found his Tumblr, which was linked from his inactive Twitter account that I found on my Twitter contact list. His Tumblr was, well, disturbing. There were graphic drawings of mutilated bodies of humans and animals, links to suspicious looking websites that I didn't dare to click on, text posts, stories about murdering, cannibalism, necrophilia, and torture. There were photos of guns, knives, and axes, which after looking closely were taken in his bedroom. The last post, around a week prior, was a text post from the account saying he wished he could find someone easy to kill like a homeless person. I was immediately filled with dread. I knew he was going to do something. He must have gone up the stairs to lock the door. I packed my things. Luckily, I packed lightly and opened the small window at the top of my bedroom's wall. I started desperately climbing through and as I was pulling my legs through, he opened the door. It was dark, but the street light illuminated enough for me to see he was carrying something long and skinny, so probably a knife. He didn't say anything. I didn't say anything. I just turned around, hopped in my car, and drove as fast as I could to my dad's house. I immediately blocked him everywhere and reported his Tumblr account, not before telling the police. They said they couldn't do anything as the guns were registered under his dad and he hasn't actually done anything yet. Nevertheless, I told my other high school friends not to hang out with Z. Ever since then, I've been creeped out whenever I meet new people. Just the realization that someone I knew so well could underneath be this person who could hurt me so bad, who could kill me. I don't know what you're doing now, Z. I'm not sure I want to know but I hope you're getting help. The moment I crossed the door's threshold and stepped onto the unstable wooden floor, I felt my bones quiver. My friend's laughter was like ribbons tying knots at my throat. Come on, it's been abandoned for years, they teased, charging ahead into the living quarters of the old, unstable house. I was surrounded by peeling wallpaper, molding floorboards, Furniture dating from the 50s and old newspaper articles were peppered across the entire property. It felt like walking into the heart of a grave. Everything slowly fading away. A memoriam to someone who'd once lived. Now it was nothing but a playground for the morbidly curious. I took another step in but remained close to the unhinged front door. I was cautious but apparently not cautious enough to decline this invitation. Cassie and her fiery mane of red hair popped up beside me. I hadn't seen her coming, let alone heard her. Her presence made my body jolt to attention and my heart jump into my throat. Don't be afraid. If there's a ghost, it can't hurt you, she whispered, a playful glint in her eyes. Cassie's confidence was intoxicating, much like her personality. She was everything I aspired to be. The word hung in the air like a bad smell. Ghost. Of course that didn't exist. But the fact that she mentioned it made the hairs on my arms rise. I laughed nervously, as if the gesture alone would shake my nerves. That's when her fingers laced with mine. My eyes widened. I looked at her with surprise, but she smiled innocently and pulled me further into the house. The deeper I ventured, the thicker the air felt. I was being crushed beneath my fears and the musky smell of rotting wood. Cassie let go of my hand and turned her attention to the small trap door in the middle of the floor. Girls, she called out, her voice laced with excitement. I wanted to turn away and run. I could see the exit out of the corner of my eye from here. Yet somehow, I turned my attention to the trap door that was slowly being peeled open. A set of narrow stairs led straight down into an ocean of darkness. My eyes could not form anything past them. I swallowed. We should probably leave. I spoke, but my voice was too timid. It must have been because Cassie followed with, 
I'll go down with my phone and see if I can find anything cool. Her smile was devilish, as if she enjoyed the taste of fear on my tongue. I wanted to interject, but by the time I swallowed, she was already halfway down. The others were giggling around the hatch, and I stood there, watching her small frame getting devoured by darkness. That's when I saw it. Eyes. Glistening, golden eyes right behind her, in the corner, swimming in the dark. The only element of light piercing through the velvet black. Cassie! I shrieked. The hatch closed. The girls jumped back, but I stumbled closer. There's something in there! I begged my fingers, attempting to pull the hatch open frantically. The others were frozen, and for once, I was the only one breathing courage. Who closed it? One of them whispered. It, it closed on its own, the other's voice replied in a quiver. One of them laughed nervously, but all of that was background noise compared to the beating of my own heart. Cassie, say something, I begged, banging on the hatch. The silence was deafening. There was nothing worse than silence. At least if she'd screamed, it would have confirmed something had happened. With silence, it leaves it up to your imagination. Why was the hatch not opening? Why was I drowning in Cassie's silence? I fell back in defeat. Sitting, my fingers raw from clawing at the wooden hatch, splintered in red. The hatch flies open and roaring laughter as sharp as a blade's edge spills out. My eyes widen in shock as Cassie's smile emerges from the pooling darkness. She's laughing, howling even. Got you guys, her words echo in my mind as I blankly stare at her face. I blink shock washing off of me in waves. I had fallen back, but picked myself up quickly. I was ready to run, the adrenaline rushing to my heart. In her arms, she cradled a small, yellow-eyed cat. I finally allowed myself to breathe. The moldy air rushed back into my lungs and my face heated up. I could imagine I was red with anger, red with embarrassment, red with shame. Had I really thought, I cleared the idea from my mind, purged it. Another hour passed and we stepped out of the bus. I hadn't yet to say a word. The others laughed so much they might have broken a rib. I, on the other hand, remained silent. The same silence Cassie had so gracefully offered me earlier. The girls had collected old books from the house. Some of them had jewelry and Cassie had the cat. We sat at the bus stop, waiting for a transfer to go to the animal shelter. We browsed through the photographs we had taken from the house. I watched the screen flip between the pictures absentmindedly. My heart still hadn't recovered. There was a picture of the living quarters with the shredded cotton blinds the damaged old chairs. Some of the girls were in the picture and behind them I noticed strings of blue light. With every new picture it looked different. There were golden and pale yellow hues entangled with them. I raised an eyebrow and leaned in. What's that? I asked as she swiped to another picture. In this one the lights looked like they formed the shape of a man sitting on one of the chairs. Oh my god that looks like a person! One of the girls exclaimed. I took the camera and quickly scanned the pictures. The next picture was of Cassie descending into the basement. The light formed a hand near the hatch. I quickly swiped again. The last picture was of Cassie in the basement before the hatch closed. I spotted the yellow eyes instantly. But what I hadn't seen until now was the smile forming in the other corner of the room. I looked up from the screen to Cassie. She looked at me and on her lips hung the same smile. I first met Kevin last August. My previous roommate had decided to move in with his girlfriend last minute, so I needed to find someone to take over his lease as soon as possible. Luckily, my friend Evelyn was happy to help. I know a guy, she told me over coffee one morning. Well, I don't know him, know him. We met virtually at the online orientation for McKinsey, and we've kept in touch. He's moving to San Francisco, and he's looking for a place. Can I introduce you? I told her that sounded good. After all, this guy was a McKinsey consultant, and he had Evelyn's approval. How big a freak could he be? I gave her the go-ahead, and she set up the meeting.
Kevin and I met over Zoom. He was remarkably like me. Asian, just out of college. I'm a recent Cal grad. He'd gone to Penn. He'd been living with his mother in Dallas, but with the McKinsey offices reopening, he was relocating to San Francisco. He seemed perfectly normal, and besides, time was running out for me to find someone. Finally, I asked, do you want to room together? Luckily, he was more than happy to take over the lease. I sent him the documents, and he signed and returned them within an hour. I waited anxiously over the next few days. I'd never met Kevin in person. What if he turned out to be weird, or worse, a serial killer? I imagined him opening my door at night, standing over me while I slept. Calm down, you loon, I told myself, realizing that I spent far too much time fantasizing about serial killers. Kevin's move-in day came, and around noon, I heard the doorbell ring. Are you Kevin? I asked, opening the door. He nodded. I am, he said, smiling broadly. Can I come in? Of course, man. It's your place now, too. He walked in, and I showed him around. Not that there was that much to show. Our apartment is a glass shoebox on the 30th floor of a high-rise building. There are modern amenities, European washing machine, Viking appliances, and a nice view of the Bay Bridge. This is fantastic, Kevin told me, admiring the bridge. Are you busy today? No, I said. What's up? Well, I wanted to buy some furniture for my room. You seem like you have good taste. Care to join me? I said sure. Kevin had rented a U-Haul, and we drove to the Ikea in Oakland. Thankfully, Evelyn's instincts had proven right. Kevin was warm and funny, cracking jokes as we crisscrossed the aisles of the store. I helped him unpack and assemble his furniture, a bed, a dresser, and we ordered pizza from my favorite place. Oh, I almost forgot, Kevin said, standing up and rushing off to his room. He emerged with a package. I got you a housewarming gift. You didn't have to do that, I said, genuinely touched. Evelyn said you like wine, he said as I opened the package. This is a $200 bottle, I told him. What say we crack it open? He smiled mischievously. That's what I like to hear. I got up and filled two glasses, and Kevin made a toast. Here's to being roommates. The next few months were awesome. Kevin was the perfect roommate. He was meticulously clean and kept the apartment spotless. He was quiet and respectful, and he was a hell of a cook. I'd arrive home from my software engineering job most days to find him in the kitchen, whipping up some dish or another. I get dinner for free at my office, but eventually, I began pitching in for half of the groceries so that Kevin would cook for me every night. Back in March, Kevin told me that he was leaving for a month. My mom is having surgery, he explained. It's just me and her, so I want to be around to help her recover. And he's a good son too, I thought. I wished him well and told him to text me if there was anything I could do to help while he was home in Dallas. The month that Kevin was gone dragged on slowly. I realized how vibrant he'd made our apartment in the six months we'd lived together. Without him, life was a lot less animated, and I found myself growing bored and restless. I counted down the days to his arrival. Two days ago, Kevin finally returned. How was your trip? I asked him, genuinely happy to see him. And how's your mom doing? She's fine, he said. I immediately noticed something different about him. There wasn't any of his usual warmth or charisma. I chalked it up to tiredness, and I told him to get some rest. I asked him if he wanted to get dinner the next day, and he said yes. Dinner didn't go as I expected. Kevin still wasn't himself. It was like someone had sucked all of the energy out of him. He'd always been the one to remind me of inside jokes. When I brought them up, he didn't seem to remember them. I pondered this more as I went to bed. It wasn't just the personality that was different. There were subtle, physical changes that I hadn't noticed. Kevin had been kind of chubby before, but he'd lost a noticeable amount of weight. Is it possible to lose 30 pounds in a month? I wondered. And was my brain playing tricks on me, or had Kevin had a tiny mole on his right earlobe? The next morning, I looked closer and saw that the mole was gone. I slept with the door closed that night. I know, because I remember the latch clicking when I shut it. But this morning, the door was cracked open. It was just a hair, so I might just be imagining things. But what if I'm not? I don't know what happened to Kevin on his trip. I'm not sure that it's actually even Kevin who's returned. 
I tell myself that I'm freaking out about nothing. Maybe he got surgery, liposuction, and a mole removal on his ear. That's normal, right? I feel like I'm going crazy. I'm at a hardware store and I'm buying a lock. During my first year of college, I was introduced to the Tor browser by my new roommate, Ricky. Those of you who have been around the internet for long enough know Tor as a browser engine used to help you access the dark web to which we frequently did. For a barely 20-year-old dude experiencing his first moments of living away from home, being handed a way to access nearly whatever I wanted just from the press of a few keys felt like being handed absolute freedom. While we mostly just used it for accessing pirated games and films, or maybe visiting a banned website, there were times I found myself on the more twisted side of it all. Now, I've honestly seen some pretty fucked shit that I really didn't want or need to see other than to satisfy my morbid curiosity of if it would be possible to even reach those places. While I mostly regret these deeper dives into the dark web, one such dive might have very well saved my life. It was about 2 a.m. on a Friday during the end of my third year of college and Ricky had been spending the night at a cousin's house, leaving me to myself. I had been scrolling through the web, going through various shady movie sites and running games I didn't technically own when I got a strange pop-up ad. One-time auction, limited items, one of a kind, get now or never again, don't miss out on these items. It read in a flashing red and green Pomic Sans font. Now I've gone to a few of these dark web auctions, even participated in a few out of impulse bidding on things that triggered something in my dumb college dude brain. This ranged from things like overly engraved gold handguns you would see Tony Montana strapping, to pounds of the finest weed grown in the purest soils of Jamaica, just to give me that little adrenaline rush of, dude, what if I actually get it? Granted, I only bid 10, maybe 20 bucks tops, knowing actually winning any of it would probably land me behind bars. I wasn't exactly the sharpest tool in the shed and would have been busted within minutes of receiving the package. This one would be different, however. I decided I'd check out the auction and click the link before browsing through the bids. At first, it wasn't anything serious, mostly firearms and drugs, typical black web catalog. As I moved down the list, the items got more extreme, much more extreme. The list started with simple low-caliber handguns you could get at Walmart in some states, but quickly changed to sniper rifles and LMGs fit for military elites, till I was eventually being offered small nuclear explosives claiming to have enough power to level small towns to ash and brimstone. Super strong pot and funny mushrooms quickly turned to advertisements for pounds of Colombian cocaine to 10 pound boxes of fentanyl pills. Shadiest of all were what I assume are experimental drugs. Black and yellow sludge like substances held in test tubes that didn't even have real names, just things like XT exclamation point, one inch, and B8 plus RVV1 slash. Judging by the descriptions, these things fry your brain considering the people selling it explain the effects through mostly incoherent, barely understandable sentences, implying they've been indulging on their own supply. I remember one going along the lines of fun green bubbles when super cool if eaten, you it's like green green blue green bubbles, they fly fly, eat up, fly down with the green bubbles. I might be paraphrasing on that, but trust me, it wouldn't have made any more sense than if I did get it spot on. Eventually, I reached what I took to be the hitman and murderer catalog. Poison brews of risin and cyanide claiming to have zero scent or taste, soundproof sneakers, weapon silencers, fake aliases, passports. People were even selling codes that were apparently instructions on how to get to areas in your location where bodies are most often hidden and never found. There were other codes that were labeled as how-to instructional tapes made by professionals on how to get away with various types of murder to even murderers. 
If you didn't want to do the work yourself, you could buy the phone number to a top-class hitman near you who will make sure your job is done effectively. Things only got worse when I scrolled to the next page to see photos of people, some even children, with their names listed underneath. They were advertising human trafficking and given each of their product a small biography of sorts as if they were stat cards. It listed everything from address to allergies, strengths, weaknesses, even down to the daily routine. Now I've seen these kinds of black room type things and was well aware of how sick people can be on the dark web, but seeing it never got any less unsettling. Especially reading some of the things these bidders wanted to do with the product once they got their hands on them. This unsettlement quickly turned to unimaginable, agonizing fear as I scrolled down to see my own portrait, one taken on my first day of college. I began to panic as I read off my card. Whoever these people were, they knew my name, age, race, height, weight, even down to the small birthmark behind my ear. Not only that, but they seemed to have known my whole life story from birth. My panic only grew wider as I saw there were already four bidders, the highest of which bidding almost 15 grand. The sickest part was these bidders left comments, things like, He'd fit well with my collection. I can't wait to have his body. I wish to taste his skin. Along with a slew of horrible, deranged shit they wanted to do with me that I, I really don't want to repeat. I fell back and began to hyperventilate. It felt my heart was going to give out and my brain was going to explode thinking of all the horrible things that may happen to me at the hands of these sick, twisted people who look to take ownership of my life. Most of the rest of the night was a blur. I remember bidding 20k off the bat to top the list, then periodically bidding I think another 3 what I felt like every 30 minutes till I reached almost 40k. After that, I must have blacked out because the next thing I remember was waking up curled into a ball under my desk in a puddle of cold sweat. It was still dark out, so the flashing lights coming from my monitor were all too noticeable. I could feel myself shaking in fear as I slowly crawled out from under the desk before slowly looking at my screen and seeing in large red comic sans, congratulations, you win, please list where you'd like to send your prize, we will send an agent to deliver your package. I felt an overwhelming amount of relief wash over my body seeing I had just bought myself. Sure, I ended up putting myself in near debt before I even finished school, but I'm alive and free. Knowing those vile fucks wouldn't be able to live out their fantasies was enough for me to forget about any possible money problems. Think I even started laughing like a madman for a second as I entered Leave Them Be. I bought them their freedom so they don't suffer. Hoping that'd be enough explanation, and thankfully it was as I answered rather quickly with another message. Understood, your product will be removed from all auctions and marked as sold. Thank you for your purchase, Evan. Reading that caused me to nearly collapse as if all the stress and tension built up drained from my body, only to quickly return as I reread the message. They knew I just bid on myself. They were still fucking watching. The next couple months were a living hell of paranoia and anxiety. I tried to explain what I could to Ricky, and he did his best to help calm me down, but it was fruitless. Eventually, though, after enough time, I was able to move on from it. More so, I think my mind forced me to block it out, but it's all come back now thanks to an email I had just received from Ricky almost eight years after that night. Please help. I don't have the money to go up against the highest bidder. I responded as quickly as possible, asking for him to send me his PayPal or something. That was two days ago. I haven't gotten a response. I think he lost the auction. I had been sent to Korea from my university a few years ago. They told me for my major I had to go somewhere in Asia, and my friend had really talked up Korea for me. I knew nothing about it, but I decided what the hell, and I embarked on a semester-long trip. I had only one serious boyfriend in my life, who I had broken up with a few months prior. I also don't enjoy one-night stands, and wasn't digging the dudes at the clubs in Seoul. 
but I still wanted to have some sort of romantic experience, I suppose. So my friend recommended I use this dating app to meet English-speaking Koreans. Now that way I could meet someone and experience the actual dating culture. I thought I'm young, so why not? I was just so eager to have new experiences. Maybe it sounds dumb to try dating in a foreign country, but it worked out for me eventually. Just not the first date. I met him on a dating app after being in Seoul about three weeks. Let's call him Tim. I still didn't know the culture or city very well and was a bit naive about everything. He eagerly wanted to meet for a date after talking to me and he seemed nice. I should have asked more questions and I should have noticed that he was not giving me many details about himself. Tim was a guy a bit older than me but claimed he was a college student. I assumed he had done his military time all men in Korea have to, and returned to school. We talked for a bit and decided to meet for a tea date near the school I went to. He wanted to come to my dorm originally to pick me up, but I live in an all-women's dorm, and I didn't want him to know exactly where I lived since we were still strangers. So instead, I insisted we meet at the main town center near the subway. He really didn't like this idea, which, looking back, was a red flag. But eventually, I insisted. The night of the date, I waited an hour for this guy. He was very late. Tim weirdly claimed he just wanted to make me wait. I thought he was kidding and messaged him a laughing emoji, assuming he was just lost. When he finally arrived, he was much smaller than I thought, but a man's height has never been something I care much about. He was also quite thin. Maybe I let my guard down because I didn't see him as physically threatening to me which was a mistake in the end. Right off the bat, he was way too touchy with me and breathed creepy and heavy. I was so put off with his demeanor. I'm usually very tolerant with different personality types, but this was very odd to me. I had been told that Korean men would be polite and not so touchy on the first date. He was also dressed oddly, like in a business attire for a date but I thought maybe that it's just a Korean thing. Again, I was dumb and knew jack shit about the culture. Then, the first thing he said to me was, you're not as white as I thought you were. I thought this was a translation error, but his English was near perfect. So I asked for a clarification and he said what he meant. I thought you would be more white. Your skin is darker than I thought and your eyes aren't as green. Are you pure European? Now I was officially weirded out. First of all, I'm pretty much as white as you can get. I'm Irish and Scandinavian, so white as hell, basically. So the fact he thought I could have possibly been any whiter was funny. And why did he care in the first place anyway? Why does my skin color matter to this guy? And why is he bringing it up? He said about three times on the date how he wished I had greener eyes. And every time I would just reply, well, maybe my online photos make me look brighter and brushed it off as him being nervous and trying to start a conversation. Isn't it funny the dumb excuses you make for people when you're panicked? When we arrived at the tea place, I tried to order a basic raspberry tea and he stopped me and told me I had to have this special tea. Now, I thought it was weird he wanted to choose my tea for me, but in my head, I brushed it off once again. He really insisted I drink only this tea type, and I just agreed. These small details become weirder later. After tea, he asked if we could look around my school. It was dark, but the school is very well lit, so I agreed. And the whole time we walked around, he would randomly stop and grab me for long hugs. At first I let it happen, but then I stopped him, and he just kept trying. He kept grabbing me and breathing hard into my neck. It was so awkward. He also would not tell me any personal details about himself. I asked so many questions, desperately trying to distract him from all the awkward grabbing and to try it and get to know him, but he would never tell me anything. He even said at one point, I'm a mysterious man, like a movie line. He also said something like, you look so much like my favorite movie character, and I asked who. But he said I would have to figure it out on my own. Finally, he said, I want to go to a dark area, and in my head I screamed, hell no. 
At this point, I wanted the date over fast. He somehow knew where there was a wooded area behind my campus and he said we should go there. I said no and that I wanted to stay near the main campus in town, but he kept pushing. Finally, he grabbed my arm and started dragging me there. He said, I can't let anyone see and I started to panic. I finally ripped my arm away and just demanded we leave and go back to the main road immediately. Looking back, I don't know why I didn't ask for help or get angry. Maybe I was scared, but I just began to book it back to the main road and he followed. We ended up in front of a hospital near the center of town and I told him it was time for him to go. I made some excuse and he was pleading with me to stay. I told him we could meet the next day. I lied and I would message him. I just wanted to get away at this point. I was pretending it was all okay just so he would leave. Suddenly, I think he's leaning in to kiss me and I immediately think, oh god no. But it was so much worse. Instead, I feel pain in my face. It takes me a second to realize he was biting my face. It was like a dog. I had never felt the sensation before. He leaned his head sideways and bit me on my nose and cheek as hard as he could. I screamed and pushed him away from me. His face looked so freaky and I barely had time to react in words. Instead, I ran up the sidewalk until I saw a convenience store on the right. I ran to the back of the store and bent down to start crying. The man who owned the store started to yell at me, but I couldn't explain my situation. I just begged him in English to let me stay. I ended up having to buy a popsicle to stick around. God, I wish I had learned some Korean by then. I guess Tim didn't follow me. I peered outside the store and didn't see him. I texted a friend and waited for them to get me to take me back to my dorm. On the way, I messaged Tim and basically told him to stay away from me. I told him he was a creep, that he shouldn't bite women, and something along the lines of me calling the police, and then I blocked him. I was so scared to walk around my school area after that. I was so afraid he would find me somehow. I am so thankful I never let him pick me up at my dorm. I called my mom to tell her what happened when suddenly she said, wait, what did he ask you? She then put some details together and realized that all of these weird things had to do with the Fifty Shades of Grey books. At first I thought she was just being silly and overthinking a bad date. I thought she was joking, but oh god, she was right. She had recently seen the movie or read the book or something and knew the details. The eye color and the way he dressed and the tea he made me drink and the random lines he said. It all matches the books and movies. For his dirty little fantasy. My mom thinks he picked me because I look like the girl in that movie to him. It explains why he was so fixated on my appearance. And his whole thing with the biting and trying to dominate me. Even if it wasn't his intention, I later learned that there are some few creeps who seek out foreign girls to dominate and have sex with as like a prize. They call it riding the white horse or something along those lines. On a happier note, this bad experience didn't stop me. I eventually met someone else in Korea and we ended up falling in love. We even did the whole long distance thing and now I'm living in Korea studying and working, hoping to marry soon. So I guess I didn't let bad creepy guys stop my life. As for Tim, let's not meet. It's been years but I will still kick your ass if I see you, and I won't have to bite. Before I begin, let me say I love my wife very much, and still do. When I said for better or for worse, I meant it. I don't love what she has become is the problem. The only reason I'm even typing this out is to get it off my chest to someone. My wife and I had been trying to have a baby for a little over a year now, but hadn't succeeded until I bought some takeout at this new restaurant near our home. Molly had miscarried the previous week and was sulking around in a depressive state ever since. She hadn't been eating very much and had quarantined herself into our dark bedroom to grieve over our latest loss. I know Chinese food is her favorite and it might be the only way to get a full meal in her. It was a nice evening overall. We watched a comedy on TV. Molly gratefully gobbled down the orange chicken with fried rice and afterwards we cracked open our fortune cookies. Mine said something about working hard. I didn't really care, but I remember hers clear as day. 
Now is the time, it read in tiny black letters. In that moment, she pounced on me. We made love most of the night, and a few weeks later, my wife was pregnant again. Once she made it past the two-month mark, we were comfortable enough to tell our family and friends without fear of another miscarriage. I felt like all of our troubles were behind us and looked forward to starting our perfect family together. Little did I know, that was far from the end of our problems. The pregnancy so far has been pretty standard, aside from one thing. Molly's cravings for Chinese food was obscene. At first, she would go through multiple cup of noodles a day, or she would cook all of our white rice and douse it in soy sauce, which wasn't that bad. It was even sort of cute at first to joke about. After weeks of this, the only thing I could get her to eat was her special order from that same restaurant. It was almost like an addiction, but anyone who's had a pregnant partner in the past will tell you that you never want to be on their bad side. I was having to make daily trips after work to the damn place, and the smell of sriracha had just begun to make me gag. And she was about 24 weeks into the pregnancy when I went to pick up her latest orange chicken fix. I found that the place had been shut down and boarded up with tape covering the perimeter. It seemed a little much for a potential health code violation, but it made me worried about the oriental chicken crazed monster that was sleeping next to me at night. I knew this news would upset her greatly, so I drove to a different restaurant and got the same meal for her just in case she was still hungry. When I got home, I broke the news to her, but then offered the takeout box as a substitute. I expected her to be a little bummed, but nothing could have prepared me for her reaction. She grabbed the box and opened it frantically near the kitchen counter. She didn't even get silverware, she just dove into the food with her bare hand. She scooped the warm food into her mouth in a primal way before suddenly halting. She frowned and threw the whole box against the wall, screeching like a banshee that it wasn't the same. I was dumbfounded for a few minutes, unsure of what to do until she stormed off to our bedroom and slammed the door behind her. I convinced myself that her hormones must be the culprit behind her aggressive behavior and proceeded to clean up the mess she left behind. The next few days, I dreaded coming home from work. The woman I married was barely recognizable in comparison to this swollen belly maniac that took her place, and she refused to eat anything except for her special order. But there's no way I could get it to her. She went four full days without so much as a nibble and it made her go a little nuts. The first day I came back without it, she wouldn't let me touch her anymore and would simply scream as if I were beating her without mercy. The police even showed up after a while to make sure I wasn't battering her. On the second day, she actually slapped me, but she's not very strong. Her nails did scratch me though, and I had to lie about it when my coworkers asked about its origins. The day after that, she just sat on my lap and cried. The collar of my shirt was covered in snot and drool as she wept for her beloved meal. She begged and begged, but I just couldn't make her understand that it was gone. On the fourth day, she locked me out of our room. She just slid my clothes and toothbrush under the door and then forced me onto the couch that night, the hunger pains keeping her bedridden after that. I had planned to talk to her doctor about fears of her starving when I came home again on the fifth day, ready for her howling screams of disapproval, but instead saw her in the kitchen with a big smile on her face. Just that morning, she was hacking bile into our toilet and cursing me for neglect. Now, she was my sweet Molly, cooking what smelled and looked like a stew. I smiled and hugged her gently, rubbing her belly with one hand. It had felt like a lifetime since the last time I held the woman I married. I asked why she seemed so chipper now, and she said that once she ate something, she felt a lot better and realized she didn't need her special order. I was relieved to say the least, and so was my wallet, but it was only for a short while. I wanted to believe the woman I shared a home with was back to her normal self again. Of course, I wouldn't be writing this if I had been that lucky. It was about two weeks later that I noticed all the missing pet posters going up around our neighborhood. The standard stuff really that I didn't pay too much attention to until my neighbor John stopped me before I went into my domicile for the rest of the day. You know it's dangerous to have a cat with a baby in the house. Could suffocate the poor thing, he told me, which I was seriously confused by since we don't have a cat. I explained this to him, even admitting my allergy to their fur, but he insisted that three days ago my not quite back to normal wife left our home and came back with a meowing pet carrier. He asked if she needed help, but he said she ignored him and quickly went inside. I asked Molly about it, but she said our neighbor was a nosy bastard and she never brought a cat home with her. I believed her, chalking it up to a lonely old man wanting some brief company until we flipped on the news that night. We had a nice evening in home with Molly in a good mood until we saw our local news reporting in front of the restaurant she had been obsessed with. The young reporter informed our town that the repulsive restaurant had been serving cats as chicken. 
My wife quickly changed the channel as I gagged and remembered all the orange chicken and even the few meals I had eaten from there. This is going to sound silly, but I couldn't get the story John told me out of my head after that either. There's plenty of things we could have talked about, but why on earth would he make Molly bringing home a cat? It was painting a disturbing picture of my wife now. I had a feeling what she was up to while I was working, but I had no proof. Not until her baby shower, that is. I wasn't invited, like most husbands, so I got the house to myself for the day. I killed most of the time with video games, but my controller's batteries had died. We have a small cabinet above our stove where we keep flashlights, batteries, and other miscellaneous items. It's above my head, and I can barely see inside of without a stool, so I grab one to make my life easier. While I retrieved the batteries, I saw an old butter tub that I never put in there. Obviously, my wife must have done it, but I wanted to know what it was there for. I took it from the cabinet, noting it made a soft jingling sound, and popped it open easily. I wish I hadn't now. What I saw staring back at me were tiny, brightly colored collars. Most were equipped with bells and even name tags. I picked one up, looking it over. It was bright green, white polka dots, silver bell, and a name tag. I didn't read it though. I was more focused on reddish brown smudges that covered the inside of the bowl and tiny braided collars. I thought I was going to have an anxiety attack until I heard the front door open. I quickly put the collars away and took the batteries I needed before playing the dutiful husband and helping get all the new items from our car for the baby room. She's 36 weeks along in her pregnancy now and I still haven't confronted her about finding the collars. I want to wait until after the kids are born so she doesn't hurt herself to spite me. According to the previous ultrasounds, we're expecting three perfectly healthy babies. I know, triplets, a little crazy, right? We went from barely able to have children to having three miracles overnight. However, it's not as fantastic as it sounds. Turns out around the same time my wife had her last miscarriage, she ordered these organic fertility pills online, and apparently they really worked. Of course, I didn't find this out until the day we realized she was having multiple babies. Our most recent visit to the clinic revealed their sexes. Two little boys and a precious girl. I can't wait to see them. They'll make this period in our lives worth it. I remember thinking as I gazed at the monochrome screen. I was on the precipice of tears when something my wife said caught my attention. It's like we're having a whole litter, she said with a toothy grin stretched across her face. That unsettled me. Especially the way she looked at the screen with her wide eyes. I don't want to believe my wife would eat our children, but it happens in nature all the time if you think about it. I had a pet hamster as a kid that ate all of her babies. It freaked the hell out of me then. The more I look at how my wife gazes at her swollen belly, the hungrier her eyes seem to me. I think once the children are able to leave the hospital, I'm going to take them and divorce my wife. However, if she resists, I'll have to put down the feral mother to protect her litter. Growing up with a sleepwalker in the family gets old pretty fast. At first, everyone is a bit concerned that they'll hurt themselves or wander out of the house. These fears aren't unwarranted, the sleepwalker isn't aware of their actions, and everyone else is usually, well, asleep. We only discovered my little brother was an apparent sleepwalker when we kept waking up to all of the doors and windows open in the morning. Since we live in a rural area, this wasn't too much of a danger beyond potential wild animals roaming in. Still, as the older sibling, my parents designated me as the official keeper of my brother's actions. We shared a room, you see, and they wanted to use that to my advantage when it came to retrieving and sending my brother back to bed. The common saying of, don't wake a sleepwalker, isn't as big a deal as you think. As long as you wake them gently and they're aware of their condition, they're not going to hurt themselves or be startled. Why would they be? They've just woken up after all. First, we tried bells on the door. When that failed to wake me up, my parents tried leaving plastic sheets on the floor. We tried just about everything you could possibly think of to try and alert me when he got up, and that was when my father came up with the idea of a string. Every night, my brother and I would tie a long string to our wrists and go to sleep like that. If he got up at any point, the tugging of him exiting the room woke me up pretty quickly. It was a harmless, noiseless, flawless plan that had me bringing my brother to bed long before he opened our home to the elements and animals outside. You get used to it. The string, the tugging, retrieving the sleepwalker, and putting them back to bed. Some nights he would get up more than once, and others he wouldn't sleepwalk at all. 
Either way, that was the only variance in an otherwise rigid routine we had. There was no spooky words out of his mouth during his sleep, no strange place he kept going back to, and no motive behind opening the doors and windows. When asked, my brother simply stated that his dream was unrelated and he didn't know why he would open the home. This went on for the better part of a year before finally dying down. We gradually stopped tying the strings to our arms before sleep because my brother stopped getting up. One night in late July, I remembered going to bed a bit earlier than usual after we took a trip down to the river for the day. Naturally, I was exhausted from an afternoon of paddling against the current and running around the nearby park with other kids my age. At some point during the night, I woke up, having become a very light sleeper thanks to my duty as watchful eye over my brother in the last year. I remembered feeling hot and sticky thanks to the human weather, getting up and opening the window, flipping the fan on, and hoping that some air circulation might help. But when I turned to go back to bed, I saw my door was cracked open about two inches wide. As my eyes adjusted to the darkness, I realized there was something else as well, a face. Just beyond the threshold of the door, a small, pale face was pressed up to the crack, one big brown eye staring in at me lazily. My fear turned to frustration in an instant when I realized I was looking at my brother, who was standing completely still outside the door and more than likely sleepwalking again. With a deep breath, I gathered myself and grabbed the door handle. Go back to bed, Jesus Christ, can't you just be normal for one night? And then I slammed the door shut and returned to bed. It was mean, but I was getting tired of it, you know? After a long day, I just wanted to sleep, and if he was just going to stand out there all night, then it wasn't my problem. The next morning was nothing special. Mom made breakfast, and as we sat down at the table, I noticed my brother wasn't up yet. That was weird. He was always an early riser and eager to greet the day. I'm guessing Joe is sleeping in today, I asked, idly picking and stabbing at my waffles. My dad set down his coffee and looked up from his paper, his brow crinkled in confusion. Joe went to stay at Andy's house last night, he said, then slowly his face softened and he chuckled. You went to bed early, so you couldn't know. Suddenly, I wasn't very hungry. My stomach flipped and my throat felt tight. When did he go? Shortly after you went to bed, when we got back. I didn't tell my parents what I saw, worried that maybe something was now wrong with me. Instead, when my little brother came home later that day, I elected to reinstate the string system just as a precaution. Joe seemed confused but was compliant, joking about how we're tied together forever. It was a strange comfort in a way. The string was reliable, predictable. And that was it. For the next few months, Joe and I both slept soundly with few sleepwalking incidents. I was thinking about dismissing the string again, but decided that just one more night wouldn't hurt either of us just to make sure he wasn't getting up and wandering off. And it had become a source of a handful of inside jokes for us, sibling bonding time, that kind of stuff. I think we both almost slept better when it was on as well. I woke up to a harsh tug on my arm quite suddenly. It was pitch black besides my alarm clock nearby, which read the time at 2.25 a.m., that wasn't the usual time Joe got up if he did sleepwalk, but variations could happen, and with a sigh, I began to throw my covers off and slide out of the bed. That was when the second hard yank on the string nearly sent me tumbling to the floor, and I found my anger welling up pretty quickly. I thought he must have gotten the stupid string caught on something and was trying to pry himself loose, so I collected myself and hurried towards the door that was already open. That was when I noticed something was wrong. The string was only long enough to keep us maybe five feet apart at the most, but this string was longer and pulled taut down the hallway and around the corner. Joe? I called quietly. This didn't feel right at all, but I made my way down the hall and turned the corner just in time for a third tug on the string. It was leading into the kitchen, which featured a door to the basement that was now wide open as well. The string was descending into it and the tugging beyond it was growing more intense. Impatient. This wasn't like Joe at all. He'd never gone in the basement before, let alone manually pull on the string. Joe? Are you awake? This isn't funny. 
I was louder this time, inching towards the open door as the string began to frantically vibrate and yank, and as if it was urging me further. The closer I got, the more excited it grew, and when I reached the doorway, the next tug was so harsh that I almost lost my balance again. Then there was a lull in the tugging when I heard a door opening behind me, the bathroom across the hall from my room. A bleary-eyed Joe stepped out and blinked, one hand rubbing his eye as he yawned. There was no string on his wrist. Suddenly, the string began to pull with a force stronger than before, making me stagger out onto the first step leading into the basement with a yell. Joe seemed to realize that I had the string on my wrist, and he didn't, and that whomever, or whatever, was in the basement was not him. There was a roar of noise, a low moaning from the darkness of the basement, and my little brother's frantic footfalls behind me as he ran his way over and grabbed my free arm to hold me while he scrambled for something to cut the string. I heard the kitchen drawers crashing open as he searched, and then he produced a knife, one shaky hand sawing at the string as the noise in the basement became so loud it seemed to reverberate through our bones. And then the tugging stopped. The string snapped away, and both Joe and I fell backwards onto our asses, sprawling over the kitchen floor. The noise ceased when the string was cut, and the basement door wobbled violently before slamming shut in our faces. Going to sleep after that was impossible, so Joe and I huddled up on my bed and sat with every possible light on in our room until the sun rose and our parents got up. Naturally, they didn't believe us, saying they hadn't heard a thing and slept soundly. They said that we must have hallucinated together, or been sleepwalking even. Either way, I know that whatever was in the basement was not my brother, and I've refused to tie the string to my wrist ever again. I am a nurse at the largest hospital in my city. Although I work on several units, I am most often on the oncology and polyotive care unit. For those that do not know, oncology focuses on the treatment and care of those with cancer and palliative care is for people who are eminently dying and require symptom management interventions. With this in mind, I have been present in the final moments of many people's lives. I consider it an honor to assist others in dying with comfort and dignity, and it is very rewarding work. However, there have been several instances when the proximity of death has brought about some unexplainable events. One particular instance that comes to mind happened in my first year of the profession. This patient had already died in the evening. Their family members had left the hospital and the body had been cleaned and dressed. It was now nighttime, around 2300 hours, and I was performing my routine paperwork while awaiting the porter to transport to the morgue. It was very quiet, and the other patients on the floor had settled for the time being. The only other noise was the hushed conversation between the other nurses and I the clicking of various instruments in patient rooms, and the constant rumbling of the building around us. A call bell chimed at the monitor on the nursing station. I will explain now that the call bell system enables someone in a patient room to push a button on the bed, which is connected to the wall, which sends a signal to a monitor at the station. There are several buttons available, including emergent, but those are not reachable from the bed and are instead on the wall. The station monitor displays the room number and the nature of the call bell, regular or emergency, along with a designated chime based on that nature. Slow, relaxed beeps for a regular bell, rapid, intense beeping for bathroom bells, bed exit alarms, and emergency codes. A light above the door of the patient's room will become illuminated. It was not uncommon by any means to hear a call bell considering the 30-odd patients on our side of the unit. It wasn't even unusual that the call bell was coming from the recently deceased patient's room because the porter often will press the bell to notify the nurse of their arrival. What was surprising, however, was when I entered the room, there was not a living person there, as I expected. The room remained as I had previously left it. Low lights, curtains drawn body in a casual supine position with the wrists crossed over the waist. Had I mistaken which room had called? I peeked above the door and the light was illuminated. Now, I thought it was strange, but sometimes these systems glitch. Alarm silenced, I returned to my desk. Approximately half an hour later, the bell was rung again. 
as before, I assumed it was the porter. And again, the room was unchanged with no porter present. I was a little frustrated as I wholeheartedly believed that the call bell was malfunctioning. I even checked that the body's shoulders were not accidentally pressing the button on the inside of the side rails, but they were not. To prevent the button from being pressed, I disconnected the cord that associated the bed to the system in the wall. It sounded a cord fault alarm, which I quickly silenced in both the room and at the station monitor. The porter would just have to come to the nursing station when they arrived. Just as I was continuing my tasks, the insistent and recognizable bed exit alarm sounded. These alarms are based on weight and are usually set directly onto the bed. When weight is removed from the bed, the alarm trips to notify the nurse that a patient is getting out of bed when they should not be. Normally, these alarms, like all the others, will be displayed on the call bell monitor at the station. Alongside this, the bed itself will emit a loud alarm. At this time, there was no alarm on the monitor, but I could hear the buzzer coming from down the hall. I rushed to the sound, expecting to find a patient halfway out of bed asking for the bathroom. Instead, my heart began to sink as I realized the sound was coming from the dead patient's room. The body was perfectly still, in the same position. The alarm was loud enough to make my ears ring. Because I had not disconnected the cord from the wall, the alarm had not gone to the station monitor, but I do not remember setting the bed alarm at all. There was no need to, as the patient was deceased. Perhaps I had forgotten to turn it off? Either way, there was no reason the alarm should be sounding. The patient obviously had not moved and remained in bed. At this point, I was officially creeped out. It is in my nature to trust science above anything supernatural, and I am not a believer in souls or spirits. However, being in a room with an unanimated body is a very moving experience. Although they may not have their physical energy or liveliness, a sort of awe-striking presence can be felt. It felt as though something remained in that room and it begged for my attention. I took several minutes of silence, just taking some deep breaths and watching the chest of the patient. There was no movement, no breathing, no signs of life remaining. I gently patted the presenting hand on the waist. It was cold and bony, and I could tell her limbs were beginning to stiffen. I left the room once more. The porter arrived about five minutes later, and I assisted them in placing the body on the stretcher and applying the drape. I then called a housekeeper to clean the room, and within an hour, a new patient was being admitted. The other nurses had commented on how weird those alarms were, but what truly got to me in the end was the remarks of the new room's occupant. This person was fully lucid and oriented with no inclination towards confusion or delirium. They asked me point blank if anyone had died in their room recently. I asked why. They then proceeded to say, it was an elderly Asian woman, wasn't it? And she died of lung cancer. I didn't know how to respond to that description, as it was accurate to the body that I had previously mentioned. The patient must have read my surprise and nonchalantly said, Very well, can you at least open the window for the poor woman? I did as was requested and never heard about it again. I have had several other experiences that gave me goosebumps, but this is one of the most vivid I can recall. I used to work the night shift at the hospital. There's a reason they call it the graveyard shift. But that's another story. I don't particularly like the place, but they pay well, so I can't complain too much about being the lucky guy who gets to clean up the operating rooms after an operation. At least I had some company. His name is Joe, and he's not very outgoing. I had to ask one of the other janitors to find out his name. He likes to keep to himself and I've never heard him talk. He's a big guy and he has the job of mopping the hallways. He does a good job, but that's mostly because he mops so slowly and methodically that he can't possibly miss a spot. Joe is a bit of an odd bird. He wears surgical gloves and mask along with a surgical hat and gown. Maybe he's paranoid about germs. The way this hospital is run, who can blame him? Even though he's not very social, it's good to have him around, especially at night when I'm cleaning up the bloody rags and sometimes pieces of botched surgeries that litter the operating room floors. Every once in a while, Joe could be called upon to take one of the bodies down to the morgue, and yes, the morgue is the creepiest place you could possibly imagine. Trust me, you never want to go to the morgue, especially at night. 
One of the things I learned early on is you never look at the bodies. Your imagination will take over every time and you will see something twitch underneath its sheet. That's why I stopped looking. When I have a delivery, I do it and get the hell out. Sounds? Of course you'll hear sounds. Once again, it's probably your imagination, but every once in a great while there's a twitch or two, and then there's the person who's not quite dead, but that also is another story. You could say I've seen a lot of things during my time here. Some of the most disconcerting is the bloody handprints on the wall. I've never figured out how they get there, but as for my job, I clean it up, punch out, and go home. Do I ever mention anything to the hospital administration? Nope. I discovered long ago that there are things they just don't want to hear about. So I clean it up, keep my mouth shut, and collect my paycheck. On this particular evening, as I rolled my gurney back out of the morgue, my imagination made me think that I heard a thump. A heavy thump. However, the more sensible side of me completely ignored it and kept on pushing the gurney. At a slightly faster speed? Maybe. But nonetheless, I ignored it and went about cleaning the next OR. I became so involved in listening to my music that I never heard the doors of the room open and close again or the footsteps approaching me until it was too late. I turned around and there was a corpse lurching, arms outstretched, mouth open three feet from me. I froze with fear, my mind shutting down. This thing didn't seem possible. I was too stunned to defend myself. The horrid stench that emanated from it was nearly enough to finish me off. It approached, teeth bared, inches away from this macabre feast. My mind was paralyzed with fear and utter shock. And then my mind dropped further into denial when Joe burst through the door, lumbered over, grabbed the corpse, twisted its neck until I heard a sickening crunch, then threw it against the wall as if it were a rag doll. The corpse crumpled to the floor as Joe pulled off his mask to reveal a nightmare face of deathly pale skin and sunken cheeks. He seized the corpse and began chewing on its neck. He feasted on the gore of the corpse as he ripped it to pieces. The corpse twitched only twice and then ceased to struggle as Joe devoured it. A few minutes later, Joe stopped, allowed what was left of the body to fall to the floor, and looked straight at me. I'd never seen that look in his eyes before. They were inhuman, fierce, and unnaturally hungry. He advanced, arms reaching toward me. Finally, I could see Joe's face up close. His skin was pale and rotting away like a corpse. His teeth were yellow and mostly gone. As he advanced, I realized how completely helpless I was. I realized that my rescuer had become my doom, and I would soon share the same fate as the unrecognizable pile of gore that lay beside me. And then he stopped. The glaze lifted from his eyes. He looked at me, pulled his mask back over his face, and lumbered over to the body. He grabbed one leg and drug it out of the room, leaving a trail of blood and body parts. I sat there for a long time, trying to convince myself it was a horrible nightmare. But every time I opened my eyes, the bloody splotch on the wall and the trail of blood were still there. I started mentally updating my resume, eventually finding the strength to get up and shakily walk across the room. When I stepped into the hallway, there was Joe with his back to me, slowly mopping up the trail of blood that led back to the morgue as if it was another boring night. He looked back the hall at me for one moment and then went right back to mopping. This story was written by David Fueling. When I first started sleepwalking, my wife mostly found it funny. She stays up much later than I do in the evenings. Apparently, I've started finding my way to her home office just down the hall from our bedroom. If I can even remember these encounters at all, then it's only ever in hazy snippets. You flirt with me, she insisted. I didn't like to hear this, because to me it was someone else inside my body. From my perspective, something weird and embarrassing was happening to us both on these nights. What do I say? I asked her. It's just gibberish, she answered, then laughed. But your body language is definitely like you're trying to be really smooth. You're trying to talk me up. If it happens again, I insisted, please wake me or take me back to bed. Babe, I promise it's okay, my wife smiled. It's cute and it's harmless. She wouldn't feel this way for long. I tried home remedies at first. I maintained good sleep hygiene and abstained from alcohol. Nothing worked though, and so I became frustrated. It got bad enough that I started using the terry cloth sash from my bathrobe to tie myself to our bed frame. It sounds silly, but it worked, at least for a while. 
I double knot the sash around my right ankle. The other end was wrapped securely around the leg of the metal bedpost. If I tried to leave the mattress, I'd have to carefully undo the knots to free myself. That was fine, because I'd wake up as my brain struggled to find the knot's weak spot. Things became disturbing when my sleepwalking body discovered a new way to get free. I can only remember the end of the event. My wife's fearful face broke through the reverie, and I felt a sense of deep shame. That's what woke me up. She says that I tried to flirt with her again, but this time I was carrying scissors in my hand. I had cornered her in her office, and she could do nothing but pray I decided to leave her alone. I didn't seem aware I was holding anything. When her fearful expression stirred me awake, we returned to the bedroom and it became clear what had happened. You rolled out of bed and onto the floor, my wife whispered with some astonishment. You were still connected by your ankle. She pointed at the severed rope sash trailing from the bed frame's leg. You must have reached in my sewing dresser, searched through it, and found scissors to cut yourself free. Indeed, around my ankle remained the other knotted half of the rope sash. My wife and I talked earnestly about our concerns the next day. I hate that I do it, I told her. Can't you please just shake me awake as soon as I bother you? You were carrying scissors, she exclaimed. Anything might have happened. Haven't you heard about never trying to wake up a sleepwalker? What if you became violent? I know, I said. I felt intensely guilty. I've heard that before too. But look, I woke up randomly last night and nothing bad happened. It's the same as when I tried to untie my ankle. I never lashed out. I think you should wake me. The dangerous part is when I'm still asleep. I'll try it, she finally agreed. But please make an appointment with a doctor right now. I will, I nodded. She was right. The home remedies clearly weren't enough. I made an appointment with a sleep clinic for the soonest possible date. It was two weeks away. We moved all sharp objects out of reach from the bed, and I bought a new piece of fabric to restrain my ankle as we'd done before. I hoped it would be enough until my appointment arrived. The worst part of sleepwalking is that I genuinely don't remember anything until my mind starts to awaken. Sometimes this occurs in response to a stimulus, and sometimes it doesn't happen at all. Each episode usually results in a vague but humiliating memory of my wife either laughing at me or looking very afraid. Sometimes I don't remember anything at all. My only clue is when someone tells me or I notice something has changed. On the night before my sleep clinic appointment, I went to bed and woke up feeling completely normal. There were no new memories. Abruptly, I realized that I'd gone to bed in pajamas but was now wearing only underwear. When I inspected my body, I found several deep bruises on my arms. There was also a bad friction burn on my ankle. Something serious just happened. It was early on a Sunday morning, so I sat alone and worried while I waited for my wife to wake up naturally. I didn't want to disturb her rest any more than I already had. I felt an awful sort of trepidation. I badly wanted to ask what happened, but I was also dreadfully afraid to actually know it. When my wife finally awoke, she seemed very strangely shy. She wasn't angry, but she also didn't want to talk to me at all. Please, honey, I implored her. I need to know. Was it worse than usual? How did I get my ankle free from the bed? You don't remember anything? She asked tentatively. There was real fear in her eyes now, and I hated myself for giving her that feeling. Usually, you at least remember how it ends. I'm so sorry. I felt tears welling in my eyes. I didn't even know anything happened until I realized my pajamas were gone. Well, if you really don't remember, then I don't want to talk about it at all. Let's just both forget it entirely. She wouldn't budge, and the tension between us lasted all day. I'm just glad you're going to the clinic. That was the only thing my wife would say to me. She'd repeat it whenever I tried to engage her. It was an overnight stay at the sleep clinic. They prepared a cozy and safely furnished bedroom from which to monitor me. In addition to tracking my vitals, there would also be a video recording for us to review in the morning. Behind a one-way mirror, a sole technician would watch to ensure that I didn't hurt myself or do anything dangerous. I awoke the next morning with only one faint, new memory. I remember standing in front of the one-way mirror and tracking the dim shape of a person behind the glass with my eyes. The technician confirmed that I watched him carefully and shifted my gaze whenever he moved. My memory of that only lasted a few seconds, but the video showed there was much more to it. The footage showed everything. 
I sat up in my bed around midnight, then worked dutifully at the knot around my ankle. It sometimes takes me about 45 seconds to untie myself when I'm already awake, but that night I stared and worked blindly at it for more than 13 minutes. With patient random tugs at the outside of the knot, I set myself free. Now standing, I walked directly to the one-way mirror. I got close enough that I was nearly pressing my nose against it. That's when I began tracking the technician with my eyes as the faint shadow of his body moved behind the tinted glass. I stood and stared for three and a half hours, then returned to bed. I only spoke at the end, just before I swayed to turn my back on the technician. I spoke a few lines of gibberish, after that I started humming loudly. The tune was just the two of us. That old song from the 80s. The camera caught my face twisting itself into a very sinister smile as I did so. As I lowered myself back into the bed, I called out loudly, Just so lucky I can't get you. What the fuck? I've never threatened anyone in my life. I'm terrible at even pretending to be intimidating when I'm awake. Now I'm staring down strangers and meditating on how they've been left alone with me? Why would I say that my forced isolation was lucky for the technician? What the hell was I planning? The doctors wrote me a prescription that really helped, and I honestly thought that was the end of my story. I took one pill at the end of each evening, and they never failed to put me into a deep and uneventful sleep. There were no more weird nights or awkward discoveries in the morning. My wife even started to trust me the way she used to. She'd laugh and grin when we talked again. It was such a relief. We'd had a rough patch, but now it seemed to be behind us. Maybe we should crack a few beers, hun, my wife told me as we sat down to dinner last night. Or we could open a bottle of wine? Her friendly smile made my heart feel safe. No more sleepwalking means we can enjoy a few drinks together again. My wife shot me a playful look and grabbed a corkscrew. It was true, I'd missed drinking a bit. I agreed and we drank and laughed while eating our meal. It was a lovely evening, but my tolerance for alcohol was low. I had accidentally gotten myself drunk by the end of the night. Around 10 p.m., I collapsed into our bed, completely forgetting to take my pill and tie my ankle to the bed frame. I awoke this morning with no new memories. The only clues that I've been sleepwalking are the things that have changed. My wife isn't in bed beside me. I search my mind but find absolutely no clues. Last night was a perfect blackout. Looking down, I see the crimson fingernail scratches all over my arms and chest. I touch my face and find more deep abrasions there too. My neck is bleeding slightly, and there's an aching tenderness in my right eye. I must have been struck in the face, at least once, hard. Someone was struggling to make me let go of them, and that struggle seems to have lasted for a long while before it ended. It's 7 a.m., and my wife isn't asleep in the bed next to me. In the back of my head is a feeling that I can almost taste in my mouth. A sour flood of terror and shame runs a circuit through my whole body. I realize that whatever I did is already done. There's no stopping it and no taking it back. That awful sort of trepidation returns. I want to ask, what happened? But I'm also dreadfully afraid to actually know. The only words I can think of now are, oh my god. What did I do? This time though, I think I can guess. I've shouted her name several times, loud enough that anyone in the house should be able to hear it. I'm too paralyzed by fear to open the door and leave the bedroom. Every second before the terrible answer becomes one more second of blissful ignorance. Please God, tell me I'm still dreaming. During 2020, I knew of many friends who were let go from their jobs due to the lockdowns, myself included. I worked at Disneyland at the Lamplight Lounge as a host, and when it was announced we were closing indefinitely, I grew sad. Sure, making money was one of the main motives of working there, but I also enjoyed being able to get out of my house and interact with people. But because the current situation had me thinking about how I would pay bills, I started job searching to no avail. One day I was working on my resume, and one of my friends had mentioned how she was making pretty decent earnings working for food delivery. How I hadn't thought about that, I had no idea. 
I guess I was just so into trying to get a job similar to what I used to do that I didn't think about delivering food. Although when you think about it, they do share their similarities. Anyways, one thing leads to another and I started working for Grubhub. Pretty easy gig. You worked as much or as little as you wanted. So as I had nothing else to do, I was pretty much working all day every day I could. How simple. Except the order. Go to the restaurant and pick up the food, and then deliver said food to the location you're given. How bad could it be, right? I mean, you're most likely asking yourself, what's so scary about being a Grubhub delivery driver? Nothing really. It's just the fact you don't know what kind of people you're going to meet at the end of your delivery, which is what makes this story that much more intriguing. Anyways, enough backstory. Let's get into the meat and potatoes. It's a Saturday night and I'm just winding down from my day of delivery. Before I decided to call it, I accepted one more order from McDonald's, which was only about 5 minutes from my current location. So once I grab the food, I begin a roughly 10 minute drive to the house in question. Unfortunately, the address I was delivering to was in a pretty sketchy part of LA, where the story takes place by the way. But what could be the worst that happens? It should just be a quick drop off, and I'll skedaddle out of there. I remember passing by a home that was covered in yellow police caution tape, and I even saw another home with bullet holes in the walls, which brought chills down my spine, reminding me of the true crime documentaries I binge watched. Anyways, as I pulled up into the cul-de-sac in question, I saw a group of about 10 males surrounding some low riders and listening to some music in Spanish. They were anywhere from about 20 to 30 years old, with long white t-shirts, large blue jeans, similar shaved heads, and tattoos over their arms. I also noticed they were drinking beer as there was a large cooler next to them. One thing they did do was a sort of death stare at me and my car, which honestly made me think I was about to get clapped, so to speak. Either way, I ignored them and I finally reached the house. It was pretty old. There was a flickering light on the front porch and a couple of dudes hanging out on their lawn chairs, smoking cigars and laughing. A pet bull that was behind a fence startled me as I approached the men, who tell me to leave the food on their little table. Now I'll admit, I don't like to judge people or locations, but I was really scared for some reason, and I was about to find out why my senses were running wild. Once I dropped off the food and they thanked me, I turn around and start to head to my car. But I noticed two of the men I saw when I turned into the cul-de-sac walk over in our general direction and started yelling and cursing in their drunken states. I wasn't sure if they were speaking to me until the two behind me on the front porch started yelling back and telling them to get lost. It wasn't really my problem, and when I got into my car, I sighed a breath of relief. But what happens next has remained a memory even until today. Once I passed the two drunken guys, I heard a pop, which I determined to be a gunshot. The rest of the group who had been drinking quickly stopped what they were doing, and they began running in the direction I had just come from. I even noticed some of them had pulled out knives and pistols. Needless to say, I can safely assume I had avoided a serious fight and crossfire, which could have seen me get hurt. Anyways, in summary, I stopped delivering food after that night, and luckily I was able to get a job working at a grocery store in the deli section. That is until just a couple of months ago. Disney called me back and I'm once again working at the Lamplight Lounge, where I haven't had a single problem since. I was about 20 or 21 at the time this incident took place. I was a female university student, but I commuted to my campus, so I lived at home. A good friend of mine went to the same school, so we stayed close into our adulthood. She had recently started working out at a branch of a popular chain of gyms that was nearby, and she asked me to be her gym buddy. I was more than happy to, and I started joining her. Whenever we went, we had our little routine, weights, cardio, and then to the pool. This gym had a great pool for laps, but of course you had to shower before you got in, especially after working up a sweat doing other exercises. The locker room connected the main section of the complex to the pool area, and it had little cubicles to shower off in. We used these showers all the time without a second thought. The building had been around for a long time. Before it was this particular gym, it was another gym from a different company, and so on. The place wasn't exactly modern or renovated, and in some areas, 
the showers in particular. It was pretty dilapidated. Some of the tiles were cracked or had fallen off completely. One day, the stall I was in was missing tiles all around the handles, but I didn't pay attention to it. I figured it was only pipe work back there. But that day, I got an odd feeling. So, I bent down to look through the hole in the shower wall. Lo and behold, there was a pair of eyes staring straight at me. I could tell it was a man, maybe middle-aged. Even staring directly at him, having caught him peeping, he stared right on. He never looked away. His gaze, animalistic and intent. The hole went straight through to another room, presumably the showers in the men's locker room. I turned the shower head so that I could hide in the corner and finish up out of his line of sight, and I promptly reported it to the staff. They went looking for him in the men's locker room, but never found the culprit. I jogged my memory, trying to recall if any particular person had been watching me in the gym that day, but it could have been any one of dozen or so men I casually walked out next to. In the same room, none the wiser. Within only a couple of days, the staff had patched up all the shower walls. I'm glad it won't happen to any other unsuspecting girls there, but shower peeper? Let's not meet. <laughs> All right, so this happened at my parents' house when I was 16 or 17 years old. 25 now, but thinking about it still gives me the goosebumps. It was nearing the end of my summer break, and my parents decided they were going to go on one more fishing trip before the students all get back in school. My mom ran a cafe in front of a high school. They gave me the usual rundown of how to reach them and blah, 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 and were on their way. My parents took my dad's Jeep, and my mom's car was in the shop because... Well, she's a small Asian woman who refuses to wear glasses. So going out was completely out of the question for me. So I did what any teenage girl would do with a house of empty adults and a fully stocked bar. My dad is quite the drinker. I stayed home all weekend and binge ate snack foods and watched every Netflix B-horror movie I had rented. Thank you, Dad, for the three movies at a time rentals. It was Saturday night well into the a.m., and I was downstairs on my dad's leather recliner, had a bowl of popcorn, eyes glued to the TV as I watched Ringu. I had all the lights off to really get myself in that horror movie feel when I really, really had to pee. I didn't want to turn on the lights because I'm lazy, so I walked over to the half bath by the front door and did my business. I didn't bother turning the bathroom light on because, eff it, staying lazy. As I sat there, pondering the plot of Ringu, I looked up at the window that faced the front of the yard. It's an oval window and instead of buying curtains for it, my dad just used some of that frosty privacy film. It basically keeps anyone from looking in, but you can vaguely see things if you look out. Well, as I zoned out, I noticed something quite odd. There's a shape on the window that looks a lot like a person. Now the reason I say this was odd was because the front porch lights were off. There was a shadow because of the street light in front of our house. As my gears were turning, the shadow moved out of sight. It was at the exact moment I realized that whoever was out there got past the lights without them going off. Like most porch lights, ours were motion sensitive. In actuality, ours were super sensitive. A good sized leaf could set that sucker off. The only way to not make those lights go off is if you go around the side of the house and crawl over the banister. As I realized this, I also realized that this person was standing in front of the front door. <laughs> I no longer had to pee. I awkwardly slid off the toilet, pulled my pants up and did a military style crawl into the living room and freaked the fuck out. Whoever this individual was had to have practiced not making that light go off. Also, there were no cars in the driveway, so they know no one is home. There's always my dad's Jeep or my mom's car in the driveway. This was the first time there wasn't. I'm lying on the floor and my ears perk up at the sound of someone pacing the front porch. And now, I'm scared they're actually going to break in and see this small girl all alone in the house. I'm not particularly stupid, so I make my way, crawling, mind you. I'm terrified so my legs were not cooperating, to the kitchen, and grab the telephone. As I grab it, the footsteps stop, as if someone left the porch. I turn to look at the front door and realize the lights haven't turned on. We have those small, useless windows above the door by the ceiling. So that means the person jumped off the side. I look towards the back door and before my eyes make it, they fall onto a window. 
a window that has the blinds raised. I don't think I've ever ran so fucking fast before. See, we keep the blinds up by the kitchen table because our two cats are little shits and will destroy the blinds if they can't see outside. I ran over to the window and closed the blinds and sat on the floor. I have no idea if the person saw me, but if they knew that much about the porch lights, they know that those blinds are always raised. There was still a glow from the TV, so I didn't see anyone when I ran over, but now I'm twice as horrified. I kind of sat there for a bit, straining to hear any movement outside, but I wasn't hearing them until I heard the porch door get shaken. My dad put a hook on the porch door so that we could let the cats out without them running away. But most of the time, my mom forgets to hook it closed because she's short and way forgetful. The reason I heard the door shake was because my dad must have locked it last time he was out there. Full panic now. Three things. One person knows how to work porch lights. Two, they know about uncovered window that I hopefully covered in time. Three, knew about the porch door being unlocked 99.9% .9 of the time. Now, while I should have called the police at this time like a smart person, I called my dad. As the phone is ringing, I'm making sure the back door is locked, the door to the garage is locked, and the front door is locked. It took a while, but my dad answers the phone half pissed and half worried. I tell him not to freak out, but that I am freaking out. I pretty much tell him what's happening, and he's like, call the police, what the fuck? At this point, I'm in my parents' room and flick on the lights. I tell him I will, but that I wanted to call him, you know, just in case. He said he'd call the neighbors and for me to call the police. The reason I turned on my parents' bedroom light was to, hopefully, give the image that an adult was present at the home before I called the police. I casually turned on every light in the house. By casually, I mean I ran around the house like a madwoman. When the police came, no one was found. In fact, I was so afraid to actually open the door to the cop, I demanded he show me some identification. He showed me his badge and called the police station to confirm his identity. My neighbors let my parents know I was safe and that they didn't find whoever was walking the house. My parents drove home right after the phone call and my neighbors stayed with me until they actually arrived. For the following week, I was horrified to be home alone. Not to mention we have woods as our backyard. So I was scared that whatever it was, was skulking in the woods, waiting. I refused to open the blinds for the cats and to use the downstairs half bath. What's even scarier, is on the end of that following week. A woman's house was broken into and she was raped. Her husband had left for a business trip and the perp broke into the house via the back door. Just knowing that if I was asleep or if they realized a teenage girl was home, I would have had a completely different experience. So this was a few months ago and quarantine was already in place. So I spent a lot more time at home and around home than usual. There is a park very close to my house, so one day I decided to go for a little jog. I ran from my house into the park, and since I don't have a lot of cardio, I decided to take a little break. I noticed that a guy was looking my way, but I didn't think anything of it, until I started jogging again, and he started walking at the same time. Since I was jogging, I eventually lost him so I thought it was over, but oh was I wrong. It's now many hours later, and I'm sleeping, when through the window I notice car lights coming back and forth on my street. The window in my room gives me a view of the street. Now, some may think it's normal, but I live in a very quiet neighborhood, so I wanted to see what was going on. As I thought, there was a car that was traveling back and forth on my street. Then, the car stops right in front of my house, and the same guy comes out of the passenger seat, which means there's at least one other person with him. Until that point, I was still half awake, but the sight of that same guy looking up to my window, seeing me and smiling, woke me the F up real quick. I immediately closed the blinds, which are a tiny bit see-through by the way, and climb in my bed, phone in hand. After a few minutes, I fell asleep, only to be woken up by light tapping on my window. Remember when I said that my blinds are see-through? Well, I could make out the silhouette of a man, probably the same guy since there were still car lights in the street and he was crouched at my window tapping from outside. The first thing that comes to my mind is to not move and try to pretend that I'm still asleep, not knowing if he could see inside my room or not. And then I remember that my room is on the second floor. How the hell did he climb onto the little roof area outside my window? Absolutely no idea, but I know that going down is not easy. 
I slowly pulled the covers over my head and called the police, whispering and telling them that the guy was still tapping. They told me to slowly get out of reach of the window, in case he breaks in or something, and that they would be there in about five minutes. I crawled out of bed and into the bathroom, where I could see the street behind my house, and waited. After a couple of minutes, I heard the knocking stop, then silence, and then a big thump, then more silence, and a knocking at my door downstairs. I was still on the phone with the operator when I heard someone call out that it was the police and that the guy was gone. I told the operator that police had arrived, and they told me, wait, there was silence, and she said that police was not yet arrived, and to not open the door under any circumstances. Soon enough, she tells me the police is now there, and that I can go open the door. I go check outside of my bedroom window, out of paranoia, and there were in fact three police cars, and about five or six police officers outside my house. I go downstairs, as one of them is knocking, and I open the door, thank the operator, and hang up. I tell them the whole thing, and they tell me that the guy was already gone when they arrived, but that there was no one there anymore. In the next days, I saw officers on my street, but I never got news from the guys. The only thing they found was a rope and a small knife, no fingerprints, no guy, no car, nothing. This happened years ago, but still affects me to this day. The summer after I graduated high school, I was still living at home. I was up late once night and was packing for a camping trip with my friends. It was unbelievably hot and had the window open as I sat and folded clothes. It was around two in the morning and the next thing I knew, there was a hand coming through the gap in the screen of my window. I screamed and the hand flew back out. I was stunned, but there was a part of me that wondered if it was my younger brother pranking me. I got up and looked out the window and just saw the figure of a man staring back at me. I ran into my brother's room and he was there playing video games. We called the police who came and searched the area. They found nothing, warned me and my parents to lock the windows and doors and left. We were all still shaken up and my mum had a feeling that he would come back. It turns out her mother's intuition was right. She went outside and waited on our back porch. After 20 minutes or so, she saw a man, dressed in black, slink into our backyard along the tree line. There wasn't a fence on that side, unfortunately. He hid behind a tree for a few seconds and ran to another tree and hid there, slowly working his way towards my window. My mother yelled something to him and he took off running. The police came back out and again found no trace of him. I never opened that window again, not even the curtains. My parents installed some motion detecting lights and that seemed to be the end of that. About six months later, my friend and I got an apartment downtown together. We were really excited as this was our first place on our own. The apartment wasn't exactly the best quality but it was so fun to be living in the city. The downside was that it was street parking only. After a few weeks, my car was broken into. Nothing was taken, but a single rose sat on the passenger's seat. It was creepy, but I vowed to be vigilant and safe. I always tried to park close to the entrance, near the lights, but often it was difficult to get to those spots and I would often have to park further away on darker streets. Things quickly began escalating at this point. My car was broken into at least once a week. Most of the time, a flower was left which I always threw on the ground, but once a pair of men's underwear was left, and even more creepily, once a bag of Tootsie Rolls, as they were my favorite candy. This made me wonder if the person knew me personally, and I started to become suspicious of everyone. There was a laundry in the basement of the apartment, and one day I went down to get a load that finished drying. As I started to fold, I realized all of my undergarments bras and panties were gone. Another week, I had a male friend over from school and his tires got slashed during the visit. By the time the first letter arrived, I had already started making plans to move elsewhere. The letter described a love for me that had been going on for years. He noted things that proved he had been watching me closely. I was able to arrange for another friend to take over my lease and I moved in with another friend on the other side of the city. It was a secured building 
and had an underground parking garage that was only accessible to tenants. I felt much more secure, and the extra money spent was well worth the peace of mind. Things were quiet for a few months, and then my roommate got a boyfriend. Most of us were wary of Ashley's new boyfriend from the beginning. For one, they met on MySpace after he reached out to her. Another reason was that new boyfriend, Matt, was extremely good looking, and while Ashley was a wonderful person, she just wasn't the type you would typically expect someone like him to date. Ashley was thrilled. She had never had a boyfriend and really felt like he was her Prince Charming. I thought he was weird and creepy from the beginning. Matt was on the quiet side and always seemed to be sporting an uncomfortable, leering smile. It was difficult to carry on any sort of a conversation with him because he would always make it weird with some random facts that were completely unrelated to what we were talking about. I had deleted my MySpace when the initial stalking began, but I created a dummy account to learn more about Matt. It didn't look like he really knew any of his friends in real life. There were only pictures of himself, and the rest of the information was vague. My friends and I gently tried to discourage her from seeing Matt. He technically hadn't done anything wrong, but he was just so… strange. She would immediately get defensive and would shut the conversation down. Matt started to spend more time at the apartment, and I found myself finding any excuse I could to avoid coming home. One day, I came home from work and found Matt on my couch, alone, drinking a beer. Ashley had been called into work, and she told him he could just hang out. I was furious because I didn't want to spend any time with him, so I grabbed a beer and a snack and headed off to my room and shut the door. About 30 minutes or so, he knocked on my door and suggested we watch some TV and get to know each other better because we both loved Ashley. I didn't want to, but decided that maybe I needed to give it a try. He put on a movie and I tried to just focus on the movie because I didn't want to talk. At one point, I glanced over to Matt and he was staring at me with a smile on his face. I snapped a what at him and he just continued smiling and said, I just can't believe it. Believe what? I asked. He said nothing and went back to watching the movie, still smiling. I had no idea what he was talking about but the interaction had every hair standing up on my body. I excused myself and locked the door to my room. Another month or so went on and I had managed to avoid being home for much anything beyond sleep and showering. Matt practically lived there and had even brought a bunch of his things into Ashley's room. I really didn't want to move again but was beginning to look for other options. On their sixth month anniversary, I saw a huge bouquet of flowers on the table and an already opened card propped up next to it. I rolled my eyes and was about to leave when I decided to see what the weirdo wrote to her. When I opened the card, my heart started beating through my chest. Without even reading the words he wrote, I was shaking. The handwriting was exactly the same as the one my stalker had sent. I had kept them as evidence and dug them out of my desk for comparison. The handwriting was unique and identical. Matt was the stalker. I called the police first. As they were on the way, I called Ashley and asked her to come over. She was at work but said she would be there when she could. I was terrified to tell her because I knew she would be shattered. The police took a statement from me and actually went to Ashley's work to get more information from her, and they ended up breaking the news. Apparently, Ashley called Matt and left a furious message even though the cops told her not to say anything and he completely disappeared after that. There was no Matt or anyone matching his resemblance at the place he said he worked. Ashley had never been to his apartment because he said had been staying with friends while trying to save money for a trip to Europe. His family lived out of state and she had never met a friend of his because he said they had a falling out because he was choosing to spend so much time with Ashley. It was all lies and in the end she was dating a stranger. We don't even know if Matt was his real name. The cherry on the top of this whole thing was when we went through Matt's things, he had left everything 
when we disappeared, and Ashley and I decided to go through everything. There was a duffel bag that was full of gym clothes, but in one of the compartments, there were about 10 pictures of me. All were taken from far away, with the exception of one of me sleeping. The sheets were current, so I know it had to have been at the current apartment before I started locking my bedroom door. A few pictures dated back to before the incident at my parents' house, which made us think that was him as well. Two pairs of my missing underwear were there, and I shudder to think of what he did with the rest. A Starbucks lid with my red lipstick marks, a necklace I hadn't even noticed missing, a few other random sick souvenirs. The police never tracked him down. I decided to accept an opportunity overseas that I had been considering and got the hell out of there. Unfortunately, Ashley and I quickly drifted apart. She had a really hard time accepting that her first love was a complete psycho. I think I had some underlying anger, maybe misplaced, for believing all of his lies and letting him into our lives. I don't know what his endgame was. Would he have tried to hurt me? Or was he simply content with being in my world? I'll never know. Being stalked changes you. Even when I lived across the world, I looked over my shoulder everywhere I went. I still have no social media accounts attached to my real name. I'm married with children and know that he moved on to torment some other poor woman. But every time I visit my hometown, I'm tense and keep a low profile. Part of me will always worry that Matt will resurface again. A couple of months ago, while house-sitting slash dog-sitting for my parents, I had an eerie feeling. As an obsessive ID channel watcher and younger female, I played it off as paranoia. During these few days, whenever I took the dog out, he suddenly began sniffing areas he never sniffed before, particularly under each of our windows. And thankfully, it's because of him that I discovered two larger footprints under a window that looks directly into our living slash dining room. Around this time, about two months ago, I noticed a man walking up and down our street that I'd never seen in the entirety of my life, small Midwestern town. He also had, in my opinion, odd mannerisms, prolonged eye contact, continued staring and craning his neck as he walked by and never returned my smiles, hellos or waves. Eventually, I became irritated due to how creeped out I was with both him and the eerie feeling in general and decided to wave. Upon no acknowledgement in return other than a cold stare, I got up and acted like I was going to follow him down the street, to which made him walk faster and turn a sudden corner. Never saw him again. Now today, I help my parents out by picking up their dog from the groomers, as it's right up the street and a safe suburban area. Oftentimes, I don't lock while running errands in town. When I returned home with the dog, I had an unexplained, horrible feeling the minute I walked in the door. Something, maybe a blanket, seemed misplaced. Something was off. I threw a load of laundry on in the basement and quickly stood up and looked around. No one there. Then I proceed to the bathroom to check my makeup and right then I look down to my left and there's feces in the toilet with no toilet paper and not flushed. I've been the only one home all morning. I immediately throw back the shower curtain and start shaking. Adrenaline? And when nothing is there, I close the bathroom door and lock myself inside. I called dispatch. They arrived in less than two minutes. Search the entire property. Make me check my laptop to see if any recent search history isn't my own. Interesting. And check the fridge to see if food is missing. All valuables are accounted for. I know this isn't my feces. No one in my family would have a bowel movement and not use toilet paper or flush. I know someone has been here. Yet, because I love horror movies and the ID channel, they think I'm crazy. Hey, dude, I now have my dad's hunting slash fillet knife on me, so let's not meet. So this happened probably around 10 to 11 years ago, 
when I was 15-16. For a little backstory, the legal drinking age in my country is 18, so if you want alcohol and didn't have fake ID or a parent to get it for you, then you had to wait around outside the off-license, liquor store for the Americans, until someone came by who agreed to go in and purchase the alcohol for you. So we waited around, found someone who was willing to go in and buy our alcohol for us, and got him to purchase a few bottles of vodka for me and few friends, two of which I was with, and the others we were meeting after we'd done this. Now, as it was around 6pm, we decided it was too much of a risk to decant our vodka into less suspicious-looking bottles in the middle of the street, as it was very busy, so we did what we would usually do in this situation, and found a nearby food place to quickly run in and use the bathroom to decant our alcohol so we could be on our way. This time, we chose to do this in a nearby McDonald's. We'd done it in before, so we knew it was a safe bet. So we go into McDonald's and head straight for the bathroom, as we'd done a million times before. As we get into the bathroom, me and my other two friends, we'll call them Harriet and Kara, all occupy one cubicle to get the job done and get out and back to our drinking ASAP. And as I previously mentioned, we'd done this lots of times before and usually opted to come in to this McDonald's, as it was usually busy, which meant no one paid attention to three teenagers running straight into the toilet without purchasing anything. So anyway, we're all in there doing our thing, when I could suddenly hear a lot of shifting and moving around above us. I figured it was possibly the air conditioning, and opted not to tell my friends, as I thought it would freak them out. We get the job done, and as we're about to leave the cubicle, we hear a giggle and, where are you girls off to? I was presenting as female at the time. I looked up and see the forehead and eyes of a male who looks to be about 30, just staring out from underneath a tile in the ceiling that he'd slightly lifted. We were all in shock, just staring at this guy who proceeded to giggle down at us and ask our names where we were going and if he could come. We're all in shock because, let's be honest, who really expects there to be some random guy in the ceiling of a McDonald's? Being a teenager who thought I was untouchable, I proceeded to tell the guy that he was a perv and to fuck right off. The guy seemed to enjoy this and giggled <laughs> a little more, still shifting around in the ceiling, never taking his eyes off of us. Now I should probably mention that along with pouring our drink into other bottles, we pre-rolled a few joints, so we were terrified to alert anyone at this point, as we were young and terrified of our parents finding out. The guy still staring at us proceeds to ask questions like, What age are you guys? Where do you live? Can I have some of your drink? A smoke of your weed? Still all the while twitching and fidgeting overhead. He then started to lift the tile, and as we were all stuck in a cubicle with this guy above us, we knew the only way for him to get down was to come down directly on top of us, so we noped out at that point pretty quickly. We went outside and discussed what we were going to do, and I decided to go back in and alert someone, as it's a very busy McDonald's, and I knew there would be women and children in and out of the toilet until closing time. I didn't want to risk that creep staying up there just to spy on them, especially since I knew he was there and had witnessed his behaviour first hand. So I go in, tell a member of staff that I'd been in the toilet for a long while taking a phone call, terrible lie, but my 15-16 year old brain was too scared to tell the truth in case they alerted the police, and that's when the guy had appeared, and to my shock, they were completely unsurprised. They were just pissed off more than anything. I seen a few male members of staff enter the toilet, and I figured they could handle it from there, so I went on my way. We still went into that McDonald's, but never had any encounters with Ceiling Guy again. We we're not even sure if the guy got caught, as we didn't hear anything about it afterwards. So, to the creepy guy in the ceiling watching the girls' bathroom with a bird's eye view, <laughs> let's not meet ever, ever again. I had just gone through a pretty rough divorce a few months ago. For the brief two years, my ex and I were married. 
Most of our nights ended up turning into shouting matches and insults. We were always so loud we had gotten several noise complaints and an eventual ultimatum that we would be thrown out of the building. Anyway, we ended the whole thing, and she got most of everything. The house belonged to her family along with most of everything in it. She let me only have my clothes, some photos, and my dog, Riley. I was short on money at the time. Luckily, a friend of mine let me stay in his home for as long as I needed. While there, I was looking for a better paying job to help me get my life back on track. My search led me to an opening for a campus security guard at the local community college. I arrived at the interview to learn that this job was for the night shift. I wasn't too sure about taking the job at first, but my bills and growing debts weren't going to pay off themselves. Needless to say, I started the next night. The campus itself was a decent size, both in terms of area and the number of students. The core campus includes 14 educational and auxiliary buildings. The security office was by the south entrance of the college, situated on the second floor of the parking garage. The two senior security guards, James and Darnell, walked me through my job description. My task every night was to complete two full searches around campus, checking all the buildings and monitoring the security cameras. My shift would start at 9.30 at night and go through 6 o'clock in the morning, by which time I'd take the bus home. The job itself wasn't too bad. I kind of developed a friendship between James and Darnell. Since there was a brief period of time, our shifts would overlap. By the time they both left, it would be midnight for me, and I'd be alone on campus. It's surreal how such a place that's bustling and full of students can quickly empty out and turn silent. When my shift starts, there's usually a few cars left in the lot for those who took evening classes. Some of the instructors and other staff would sometimes work extra late, but those instances were rare. In short, my interaction with other people besides my coworkers was almost non-existent. Sometimes on a break or in between circuits, if it stayed quiet on campus, I'd read a book or listen to spooky stories on my phone. After listening, I would start to feel a little creeped out for being in a campus all alone after dark. But I got used to it. It killed the boredom until I started my next circuit. I wouldn't find much of anything out of the ordinary aside from the random object left behind by a student, which I would bring back to the lost and found. I just had to make sure no one else was hanging around after closing. After coming back, I would check the security footage in case I missed something. There were a few screens recording specific spots with the most activity during the day. One for each parking lot, one for each floor in all the buildings, and one for the administrative office. I got decent pay every couple of weeks. After a while, I moved out of my friend's house and got a small apartment and was saving up for a used car. I felt like my luck was starting to turn around. Finally. Then, I had the scariest experience in my life. I was left alone around midnight, like always. The campus was absolutely deserted at this time like normal. It was summer during this time, so the night was pretty warm. I felt like I was building a bit of sweat in my security uniform while doing my first circuit. I came back to the security office after finding nothing of note and checked the camera feed. I found nothing in any of the screens until I checked the one for the south lot near the office. While the screen was small, I could discern the moving of a large shadow across one of the lampposts. It was doing nothing but moving back and forth across the light. The shadow looked too large to be some small bird or animal. I deduced it had to be someone parked off-screen so I couldn't visibly see them. I went out there to check things out and found nothing. If it were a person just fucking around, they would have to have left a sign of their presence. There was nothing left behind. I didn't hear a car driving off or any noise for that matter. I scoped the rest of the south lot to find the sources of the shadow. Still nothing. 
I sighed in annoyance at the thought of some jackass deciding to waste my time. Nothing else happened the rest of the night. I got used to sleeping during the day, but all I could afford to sleep on was a cheap couch that was anything but comfortable. It was rare that I got a full eight hours of sleep on it, and to top it off, the AC had crapped out. My cheap apartment had gotten warmer, making it much harder to sleep. I got to the college at the start of my shift, with maybe four, five and a half hours of sleep. I had coffee, but it only lasted for so long. With it being extremely late, my office feeling cool, and it being quiet everywhere, I started feeling drowsy. Sleeping on the job wasn't allowed, of course, but every now and then I let myself have a brief nap to refresh myself. So I set my head on the desk and fell asleep instantly. I was later jolted awake. A feeling of something very wrong switched my tired mind on alert and woke me up. I rubbed my eyes and checked the monitors to see if anything was up. I looked at the camera feed for the south lot and my eyes narrowed. Beneath one of the lamps, a person was standing. Not doing anything, just being very still. I couldn't make out any details, but this person had long black hair and looked very tall for almost reaching the light. I looked at the bottom of the screen and found the camera was still recording. Whoever the camera was showing was still there. The feeling that jolted me awake intensified and I was aware of myself shaking. A chill, colder than the air inside the office crept up my neck. My body was reacting to some sort of danger the image was giving off. Still, a weird person on the security footage was not an excuse to not do my job. I got to the lot in under a minute and I saw the person still standing under the lamplight, just being dead still. Their back was facing toward me and their head seemed to be bowed forward. As I approached closer and tried to get their attention, I found that this trespasser was very tall and lanky and was wearing a dirty white dress. I called her again, asking if she needed help, but didn't respond. She just kept standing like a statue where she was. I reached out to touch her and my hand retracted back from the burning sensation her skin gave off, as if she were on fire. I cursed and shook my hand to cool it off, and the lady moved for the first time. Her head lifted upward, as if finally acknowledging I was there. She turned around and I started to track backwards. Her body was humanoid, but she had the head of a goat or ram. The fur was pitch black, contrasting against her pale skin and white dress. Her eyes were red like burning embers and strands of flesh hung off its curved horns. As my backwards walk sped up, I could hear it give off a deep, thunderous roar. I ran back towards the office, and I swear I could hear this thing sprinting after me. I ran faster than I ever have in my life, and I barricaded myself in the security office. For good measure, I switched off the lights inside and called 911. I told them something was on campus, and they sent someone over. I hung up and strained my ears to hear any noise outside my office. It was hard to notice anything other than the pounding of my heart working overtime. It felt like an eternity before I heard the knocking at the door. The cops notified their presence, and I slowly opened the door. They questioned me about what I called for. When I told them, they looked at me as if I were a mental patient or a drug user. I played the footage back for them, and there the thing was. At the very least, they weren't going to arrest me for making an emergency call. But with the trespasser gone, there wasn't much they could do. They left, and I was once again alone. This time, I was very afraid. Not that I was alone, but afraid that I wasn't alone. And that thing was still out there. I wasn't taking any chances. I waited in that office and kept the door locked until the end of my shift. I left a note saying I resigned immediately, and I never went back.